This is Jocko Podcast number 317 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. All right. The Marine Corps, specifically the Marine Corps Institute has, well, they seem to do this on a regular basis. They put out manuals with, with some incredible insight about leadership, about human nature, about combat. And it's not just about combat. <laughs> it's not just about combat at all. The things that they put out apply directly to business and to life in general. And I'm going to read some excerpts today from a manual that was actually designed for remote learning. And I think these days when we think of remote learning, we think of Zoom mm -hmm. calls. Sure. But this is old school remote learning where you'd get a book, read a book, read a section, learn about something, take tests inside the sections. It's a, it's one of those, it's a remote learning, old school remote learning where you'd get a book, a manual, fill in answers, read sections. This particular class is called Infantry Squad Leader Combat Leadership. And I'm just gonna review some of the text. If you go online, there's you can go online and get this manual and there's questions and there's quizzes and there's it's a full on course. But the text that's in it, it's a very well written text and addresses things that apply to everything that everyone does all the time, every day. Stuff stuff we all have to contend with. So here we go. Infantry squad leader from the Marine Corps Institute. Combat leadership. Starts off with a little cover letter from the director of the Marine Corps Institute. The, the subject course provides instruction for all Marine NCOs on the conditions of combat and how they can begin to prepare their Marines for combat. Now, if you aren't a Marine, and you're a business leader, or you're a football coach, or you're a parent in a family, I think you're gonna see this applies to you too. 100%. And I know you and I can throw around 100% from time to time, just mm -hmm. sort of a little bit much, 100%. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you this one right here, 100%. Mm -hmm. So starts off, and this is the way they, this is what I like about the Marine Corps thinks through some stuff. Mm -hmm. Here's something they thought through. It starts off with this. Congratulations on your enrollment in a distance education course from the Distance Learning and Technologies Department of the Marine Corps Institute. Since 1920, the Marine Corps Institute has been helping tens of thousands of hard-charging Marines like you improve their technical job performance skills through distance learning. By enrolling in this course, you have shown a desire to improve the skills you have and master new skills to enhance your job performance. They're building you up just as you read this. You're getting in the game. Here's your personal character. It actually is gonna tell you what your personal characteristics are. You are properly motivated. You have made a positive decision to get training on your own. Self-motivation is perhaps the most important force in learning or achieving anything. Doing whatever is necessary to learn is motivation. You have it. That's a good tactic, by the way. You seek to improve yourself. Now, again, does this apply to just Marines in combat? How many human beings are looking to improve themselves? Everyone. Mm -hmm. You seek to improve yourself. You are enrolled to improve those skills you already possess and learn new skills. When you improve yourself, you improve the core. <laughs> you have the initiative to act. By acting on your own, you have shown you are a self-starter willing to reach out for opportunities to learn and grow. These are like the most positive attributes they can put on a human being and they're oh, yeah. just throwing them. How about this one? You accept challenges. You have self-confidence and believe in your ability to acquire knowledge and skills. You have the self-confidence to set goals and the ability to achieve them, enabling you to meet every challenge. You are able to set and accomplish practical goals. You are willing to commit time, effort, and the resources necessary to set and accomplish your goals. These professional traits will help you successfully complete 
this distance learning course. I was actually thinking we were gonna go into like a whole nother realm of living, but it is gonna help us with this distance learning course as well. Uh, starts off a little section called characteristics of combat. Every Marine is a warrior, a potential combat leader. You may be in combat tomorrow. Regardless of how well your unit is trained, you must harden yourself for your first action. You do not need to experience combat in order to understand the essential requirements for leading your Marines in combat. However, it is fundamental. It is your fundamental responsibility to physically and mentally prepare yourself and your Marines for battle. Now, are we just talking about Marines? What about life? What about life? You may be in a hard situation tomorrow. That's what's going on. So you gotta prepare for that. So this starts off with an excerpt. This is probably the longest excerpt that I'm gonna read. It's from a book called The Forgotten Soldier by Guy Sayre. It's a book that we actually haven't covered on this podcast. I'll go into a little bit of why that is, but here we go. We had just witnessed two or three major assaults. From the screams of anguish to our left, we concluded that a great many of our men had been killed. We had emptied five magazines and were warming our fingers on the hot metal of the machine gun. Our sixth and last magazine had been attached and we were anxiously waiting for fresh supplies. The night was continuously lit by the explosions of thousands of Russian shells, which made movement extremely difficult. Our trenches, which in any case were not deep enough, extended only to certain positions. The others had to be reached by leaps and bounds, alternating with plunges to the ground and writhing on our stomachs across dozens of yards of snow mixed with chunks of frozen earth. From time to time, we could see four figures moving toward us, jumping from crater to crater, carrying shells for our 50 millimeter mortar and magazines for the Spandau. They were still about 40 yards away when their shadowy mass was surrounded by a flash of white light. We never heard any cries. A few minutes later, I was sent out to crawl to the point of impact. The sergeant ordered me to bring back at least two magazines. I had just arrived at my destination when I heard the Russian assault cry, followed by a shower of grenades and mortar shells. The ground shook beneath me in a manner which defied all predictions. I felt like a pea inside a fierce, ferociously beaten drum. I was lying flat on the ground among the bodies of comrades killed only a few minutes before, unable to see any of the supplies I'd been sent to fetch. Then I heard the sound of a tank. The darkness all around me was broken by streaks of light and large pink and yellow explosions. In a momentary beam from some headlight, I could see a small sign marked S-157. I opened my mouth wide as prescribed because I could hardly breathe and lay where I was frantically groping for something to hang on to in the diabolical setting where horizontal and vertical alternated to the rhythm of the lights which slashed the darkness. I thought that I could recognize the uproar, the crackle of the weapon I had operated with Weiner before I had only left a moment ago and felt that my sanity might be close to collapse. I could see no escape from my situation and lay glued to the ground with my head down like a trust animal waiting for the butcher's ax. So it goes on a little bit further with this with this section which is out of that book The Forgotten Soldier and we haven't covered that book on the uh, on that podcast The Forgotten Soldier. We probably will at some point. There's some disputes about the veracity of the book. And the author, I think, I was just reading a little bit more about this last night. The author, Guy Sayre, he, he, there's some important details that he misses, that he just gets it wrong. Mm. One of them is there's some patch that they had in this in this unit and it was this highly regarded patch and he talks about how they sewed it onto their right sleeve or left sleeve or something like that and people that were in that unit said no way would any 
buddy that was in that unit ever make a mistake about where to sew that patch on. That's that's one of the types of things or there's certain weapons that he talks about that weren't there. He talks about an aircraft that didn't exist at this time. Mm. So there's some things in there that there's some details that were wrong and some of the veterans that fought fought in the same battles as him have called him out and said, this guy's not telling the truth about some stuff. And then there's other veterans that talk about the battles or that he writes about and say, hey, the only way he would have known this stuff is if he was there. Mm. So, and here's the thing, memory is not accurate Mm. and people's memories aren't accurate. And certainly people's memory about intense combat operations isn't accurate. And he eventually made a statement about that and kind of said that said hey if you want to know the historical details go ask a general that was in actually i'm about to go off a little bit he doesn't say that go he says go ask a military historian go ask a general because that's what they do i didn't want to do that i my book is about the emotions of a combat soldier mm-hmm. but the reason they put this in here is to get a good account of the chaos and mayhem and fear inside a combat and then you roll right into this section here, which is called fear of combat. It starts off with this. We have all experienced fear. In combat, fear can dominate the situation unless you and your Marines can control it. Extreme fear brings out your instinct for self-preservation. Survival drive, survival is a very strong drive, which generally will be a priority concern to any Marine. As I was reading this, and again, I'm reading these things in the context of life, and fear is something that people contend with every single day. And it's on all kinds of different levels. Yeah. But whether it's fear of presenting in front of a client, whether it's fear of asking for a raise, whether it's fear of confronting some situation, whether it's fear of going to a jiu-jitsu class for the first time, like there's all kinds of fears that people face on a daily basis. And here's some good information that, yes, it'll help you if you're a combat Marine, but it'll also help you if you're a human. Specific sources of fear. Peacetime training may not prepare your Marines for the reality that combat is often a matter of kill or be killed. Some of the specific sources of fear in combat are possibility of being killed, wounded, or captured, fear of killing, noise and sights of combat, apprehensive that you might not measure up as a Marine under fire, and the last one is fatigue. So possibility of being killed, wounded, or captured, this is a natural source of fear and always we will be present in your Marines. It may lead your Marines to run away from battle or do irrational things in battle. There is no sure way to know which Marine may be subject to such an extreme reaction to fear, to this fear until you get into combat. Fear of killing, this is not uncommon. Our society is a peaceful one by nature. We are raised to respect the rights of all human beings and have to and to have respect for life to forget these facts is to ignore the reality of our culture another one is the noise and sights of combat these elements have a traumatic shocking impact on the senses this causes confusion and a sense of chaos that be, can become particularly unnerving no peacetime Training can completely prepare you and your Marines for the carnage and emotional impact of combat. To ignore this aspect of combat is to create a lack of understanding that could prove totally debilitating to your Marines. One thing I like about this is it's no no, no punches are pulled. Mm-hmm. Hey, guess what? The carnage and emotional impact of combat, are you're not going to be able to train for that 100%. Mm-hmm. You can't completely train for that. It's not, it doesn't sugarcoat. And then the last one is the apprehension that you might not measure up as a Marine under fire or let your buddies down may be common among your Marines. All of your Marines want to be successful. Their fears, play, their fears may play on this desire and they may be deathly afraid of letting you or their fellow Marines down. This particular fear may serve as a positive factor by keeping your unit cohesive during battle. It could be detrimental if the fear overcomes the desire to succeed. And they've got a quote in here from SLA Marshall, Men Against Fire. When, fire. when fire sweeps the field, nothing keeps a man from running except a sense of honor, the bound obligation 
to the people right around him of fear of failure in their sight, which might eternally disgrace him. So it's it's interesting to think about. So this is like it says a positive factor. So how does it become a negative factor? It becomes a negative factor when your fear of letting people down doesn't allow you to actually go and do something. So if you obviously on the battlefield that could be a thing. Hey, I'm not gonna. Go, I don't want to do. I don't want to take charge of that. I don't want to step up because I don't want to make a bad decision. I don't want to let my friends down. And it can happen in everyday life. And this this does happen in everyday life, right? People don't want to look stupid. People don't want to have people uh, say, oh, you know, Jocko failed. Mm-hmm. Jocko's a loser. So instead, I just don't try anything. So we have to be careful of that. This is, the, I think, a good thing to think about. Is even though people, let's say you try something, Echo Charles, mm-hmm. and you fail, I might even verbally, oh, Echo, see, he's a loser. But you know what? I think subconsciously and in some cases consciously, everybody knows, everybody respects that you got, you know, you got up, you, you, you took a swing, right? Yeah. Took a swing at bat. Yeah. And, and especially if they're cowards themselves. And it's really easy to sit in the, in the, in the, in the audience and watch and poke fun, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't be that person that sits in the audience and pokes fun. Yeah. Get up to bat. Yeah. Don't be afraid of looking bad. I guess my point is don't be afraid of looking bad because you don't actually look bad. Yeah. When you make an attempt, when you step up, people respect it. Even if they try and bring you down, they're they're lying. Yeah. They're just yeah. trying to bring you down because they know that you stepped up and they didn't. Yeah. Don't be afraid of that. And the last source of fear is fatigue. Both mental and physical fatigue is a source of fear. As you become exhausted, your ability to reason may begin to deteriorate. As you become more and more tired, you may become indecisive and slow in carrying out your orders. When confronted daily and constantly with the stress of combat coupled with fatigue, you and your Marines may feel helpless and unable to continue the fight. And they've got a quote in here from Major General Hart from a book called Determination in Battle. It says, there's no doubt that troops, however well led, can only take the stress of battle for so long. Then they break. Ask any commander at any level who tries to overdraw the account is courting disaster. The mental and the physical constantly interact. Therefore, physical fatigue, hunger, disease, thirst, and above all, the stress of adverse climactic Climatic conditions can reduce the physical state of the soldier to such an extent that his will to fight will be broken. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. Echo Charles? Yes, sir. It does. Do you agree with that? I agree with that 100%. <laughs> do you feel like I'm personally attacking you right uh, now? Oh, yeah, I do 100%. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a disturbing thing. But this is something that you don't fall prey to it quite as much, but man, in the early days of jujitsu, and by early days, I mean when you were like a purple belt, mm-hmm. you didn't like getting tired at all. No. It used to really bother you. I still don't like getting tired. Mm. But I think, you know when you can kind of reconcile the whole big picture where, you know, you know this, this kind of... No, it's obvious now where like, okay, the best way to fight your fear is to get used to mm-hmm. that thing that's that, you know, that you don't like or whatever. So... Yeah, so you, yeah, you condition, but th- but here's this is how I know that I still don't like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where like if I didn't if I haven't done any conditioning for a while and I'm like I got to get back into conditioning that first day I'm like oh my god this is I can feel it. It's mm-hmm. like is it is I wouldn't call it a fear of the conditioning, but you ever had a work yeah, like you know okay, you know how you talk about the 20 rep squats, mm-hmm. right? You know when you got the 20 rep squats mm-hmm. coming and you know that pain is coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, you kind of get the butterflies a little bit before the. I mean, I don't know if you do. Uh, I don't get the butterflies. I, I get like the. I get rationalization. Uh, you know, so I'll be thinking, ah, you know what? I don't. This is, is this really kind of the workout that's really good for you? You know what I mean? I'll like <laughs> yeah. start having all these conversations yeah. with myself. Yeah. And that I are think just that, lies. Yeah. And that's part of it too. But mine was for real. Like, I'll, get, I'll be nervous of the conditioning. Like, I don't, because, hmm. and, and maybe this has a lot to do with like the kind of workouts that I've always like 
done or whatever, mm-hmm. where you kind of have a standard where, you, you know, okay, so if I have four exercises that I'm going to do as part of a conditioning circuit, I have four exercises, and I do one, I do the other, do the other, do the other, and I, and I have a time to rest in between, like, mm-hmm. you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, or do them all with no rest and then rest 30 seconds or whatever. Mm-hmm. To me, if I don't, if I have to rest more than thir- the 30 seconds, like, f- I can't go, you know, like, I can't, like, you know, 30 seconds comes and I can't go because mm-hmm. I got to rest more. Mm-hmm. I failed the workout. Mm-hmm. It's like going for a PR and failing it, right? How long, how do you measure the 30 seconds? I have a clock going. What do you press start when yeah. you get to the end of the, whatever you're doing? No, so you, you just have the stopwatch going. Uh-huh. So you start it and uh-huh. then you do it and you keep the stopwatch at that first circuit. Mm-hmm. So when you're done and you're back to the first circuit or you're, or you're, you're finished the last circuit, you see and you, you do the math in your head. Oh, you just run the math. Yeah. Do you ever do workouts where you're not thinking straight, like as far as running math? Because sometimes yeah. when I'm I'm not running math, yeah. man. It's oh, like yeah, some it's an added thing. There's just some things going on where yeah. it's not happening. Yeah, 30 seconds is easy, though, Yeah, to run the math. But, oh, yeah, it's an additional mental thing that mm-hmm. kind of is like. A little mental conditioning for Echo yeah, Charles. Yeah, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be nervous, though, before it. Like if I don't, if I haven't been doing it for a while, I'll be like kind of nervous, mm-hmm. like. What if I can't do it? You know, it's my workout. What the hell? What am I scared of? You know, <laughs> but it's like I'll have that thought. It's weird. All right. Well, that's an effective fear, which is the next section here. Eff- effects on the squad. Fear is infectious. It can destroy the effectiveness of your squad. Recognize fear and deal with it promptly. Boy, is that important as a leader. Automatic body reactions. Physically, your body reacts when threatened or when you anticipate danger. Listed below are automatic body reactions to fear. Trembling, heart pounding, irrational laughter, sweating, tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, fight or flight response. Have you ever been trembling in fear before? Not that I can. What think about of. so when you're getting ready for one of these workouts <laughs> that you're scared of? <laughs> no, I'm not trembling in fear now. Have you ever? I remember sometimes when we were getting ready to do an op. Like I look at some people in the room, and sometimes they w- not. Tre- I'm trembling, no, but uh, like shaking, like yeah. uh, like tapping their foot real hard and yeah. just that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. um, moving Ooh. around a lot. Yeah, super I mean, nervous. Well, that makes sense, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah, you're going <laughs> going on a. Military operation, yes, sir. I understand that, mm-hmm. but no, I haven't been on a military operation, so no. you know what? I guess in football games, before football games, I'd yawn all the time for no oh, reason. Yeah, that's one of those things, it's like involuntary, yeah, where it's weird. But what about uh, your stomach? Yes, you know, like I'm feeling a little bit sick, yeah. So it'd be, and it wouldn't be my stomach, I'd have a weird gag reflex. And remember, remember Scott Catlin, mm. oh, oh, yeah, yeah, so he would like. Every once in a while, he'd be at the tournament with me or whatever, mm-hmm. and he'd be in training with me and stuff a lot. So in the tournaments, like before my first match only, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd have a weird gag, like almost like I want to <laughs> throw up. And it, I didn't feel consciously yeah. nervous, but... Obviously, you were. Obviously, yeah. My body was like, dude, I wouldn't like throw up, but I'd have a weird gag thing, and he'd be like, don't start that shit now. And actually, you know what, though? What I messed up here is that this is... I guess it's not. It's not. It is fear. I was going to say maybe this is just about fatigue because it says fatigue causes fear. I was thinking that this was just fatigue, but no, this is actually just what fear does to you. Yeah. Some psychological reactions to inability to make decisions, obsession with minor details. Oh, I've seen that before. Yeah. Lack of confidence, breakdown of discipline. You In, in um, psychology for the incompetence, military incompetence, he talked about how some leaders would become obsessed with details, yeah. and that's just because they were just scared. Yeah, they're like, "Oh, we need to do this again. Oh, let me go. Let me get." Her. Yeah, yeah. Something to watch out for. Some extreme reactions to fear occur when the individual has confronted a situation where death appears to be imminent. During such instances, two basic forms of behavior are, have been observed: aggression and rage. One, freezing under fire. Two. Go into some details. Aggression and rage. 
from Combat Motivation by Anthony Kellett was a, is a statement from a German soldier on the Eastern Front during World War II describing how German soldiers reacted when overrun by Russian hordes. The quote below describes aggression and rage. We fought like rats, which do not hesitate to spring with all their teeth bared when they are cornered by a man infinitely larger than they are. And then freezing under fire, the other end of the spectrum, from Men Against Fire by SLA Marshall came the term freezing under. Writing about action in Omaha Beach, World War II, the quote below describes freezing under fire. They sat there numbly in the line of fire, their minds blanked out, their fingers too nerveless to hold a weapon. Fight or flight, that's what we're talking about. And here's some conditions that stimulate fear. You gotta overcome your own fears. Though you share the same risks and fear, you must be able to overcome your own fear and provide the leadership necessary to achieve success in combat. The Marines you lead are your Marines. You have lived, trained, sweated, and grown into an effective fighting unit together. Before you face a violent, brutal, and cunning enemy, you must understand the conditions that stimulate fear, inspire confidence, and encourage in, encourage in your Marines. There's a quote here from Battle Leadership Captain Von Schell, which we covered on like, I don't know, maybe the fourth or fifth podcast here. In peace, we learn how to lead companies, battalions, regiments, even divisions and armies. We learn in books and by maps how one fights and wins battles, but we are not instructed in the thoughts, the hopes, the fears that run riot in the mind of the frontline soldier. There are three conditions that stimulate fear. Unexpected, unknown, and feelings of helplessness. That's a good breakdown. Yes, it is. Unexpected, whoa. Yeah. Unknown, uh-oh. Yeah. And helplessness, oh. Yeah. And I think that's the tired part, right? Where tired mm. fatigue is it's like... Part of fear. Yeah, because you know you're going to be helpless. Straight up. Unexpected. Enemy actions that appear as a surprise will have a powerful impact upon your Marines. Being surprised by the enemy has been described as causing the, quote, will that controls fear to sag and crumble, end quote. When your Marines begin to sense that they do not have control over their situation, they may begin to panic. At such moments, you must exert a strong influence upon them to maintain control over the unit's actions. Surprise is a big deal. And you know, I, I can't help but think of this. I also think of the other end of the spectrum, the opposite end of the spectrum, which is what you want to impose surprise on your enemy, mm. right? You want to, that's one of the speed, surprise, and violence of action. Mm. Like one of the mottos of the SEAL teams mm. and really of combat in general. Because that's what it does. It just, it's the same thing, in, you know, like on the mats. That surprise thing, phew, yeah. That's when you get caught. Unknown. Your Marines will worry about what they have not seen and what they do not know. You will have a tendency to think the enemy is much greater in strength or ability, but really is not. Do not be deceived as to enemy strength or capabilities through exaggerated impressions. This is Mikey and the dragons, Mm -hmm. right? The dragons, you think the dragons are all gonna be big and scary, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And this is something important to think about because the context here is like, hey, you're leading troops and they're scared of the enemy. They're scared of your competitor. They think the competitor's got all the advantages. They don't. Feelings of helplessness. You, and it's got that capitalized, you must prevent this from taking hold. Act to direct and inspire the response against the enemy. Everyone has a job that must be accomplished. Ensure that everyone is doing what must be done. And this is key. Action is a way to prevent this condition from taking hold. Keep your Marines busy. Now look, I, I, I don't like saying keep people busy. And they do actually talk about this a decent amount in this book. But I have to admit that it is true. The, the same thing that causes an individual to get obsessed with some details mm. is the same thing when your team, they're trying to distract their mind from what's going on. So you can actually utilize w- activity mm-hmm. to prevent this, but also, so there's there's one thing like, oh, I can see that Echo's nervous about tomorrow. Hey, Echo, can you do me a favor and, uh, you know, 
help me load up the the vehicles with water. And you're like, okay, because now you're thinking about that. Yeah. That's one part of it, like almost an administrative part of it. But then also, if there's something happening, for if we're in a gunfight and you start freaking out or you start to look scared, you know, it's echo, get over there, pick up security in that door. Okay, now you got something to do. You got, you know, so there's an administrative way to do it. And there's also a an active moment to actually give people direction. And as soon as we're taking action, we're moving in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction if we're taking action. One of the worst things we can do is let the team sit there and dwell over what's unfolding around us. Let's do something. There's an example in here. He was firing behind a log. His face was gray. His eyes were dull and without hope. He stopped firing and looked around. It didn't do any good, he said. His voice was flat, and he was speaking to no one in particular. I got three of them, but didn't do any good. They just kept coming. They just keep coming. Platoon Sergeant Kazimir Palakowski, known as Ski, said, what the hell are you beefing at? You get paid for it, don't you? The kid managed to grin. As Ski crawled on down the line, the boy, now a man, was once more squeezing him off. That's from a book called Guadalcanal Diary. Richard Tregaskis. Leadership role. Additionally, the first shock of realizing that the enemy actually intends to kill you is a powerful factor that everyone will face. Until this threshold is crossed and your Marines become accustomed to the to functioning under fire, you must act decisively to ignite the confidence and individual actions that will transform fear into an aggressive response. Your presence as a leader has tremendous value in overcoming fear, particularly at night, adverse weather, or during lulls in the action. During these times, imaginations run wild, and your Marines think they may be alone or isolated. So again, taking action and, and Influencing there to be action in these moments when people are nervous or scared, that's a great move to overcome fear. Next section is stresses of combat. And again, these are extreme examples. This is combat examples. But there's stress in every job, there's stress in every business, there's stress in life. Killing the enemy that's trying to kill you is only half the battle. To your Marines, enduring discomfort, fatigue, and the other hazards of st- and stresses of combat is what must be done so they can succeed in combat. Sources of stress in combat, fatigue, discomfort, casualties, boredom. As you become, for fatigue, as you become increasingly tired, you will lose the ability to make decisions rapidly. You will become more easily confused, disoriented, and ultimately ineffective. You must understand the effects of fatigue on yourself and your Marines and when to provide for rest, especially amidst the chaos of battle. Here's some key indicators of fatigue. Reckless disregard for safety or self, of self or fellow Marines. Excessive caution or unwillingness to expose oneself to risk. Failure to fire weapons. Lack of concern for the condition of weapons or other equipment. Lack of concern for personal cleanliness. So all those things are what we need to watch out for as leaders when people are not engaged anymore. Develop, here's some things you can do. Develop a sleep plan for your unit that, to ensure that everyone, including yourself, gets a minimum of four hours of sleep per day, situation permitting. <laughs> Rest is preventative treatment that keeps senseless casualties from occurring. So there you go, Echo Charles. Got to make sure. Make sure. I want you to make sure you get four hours. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, listen. For those people that are freak out because I wake up early and think I hate sleep. I don't hate sleep. Sleep is good for you. You should sleep a bunch. It's when you heal. It's when you get strong. It's how you maintain your your mental and physical health. So you should sleep, and you should sleep a lot. Which is why I thought it was kind of funny that they said, hey, look, four hey, hours. at a minimum, you got to get four hours. Yeah, you got to get your I four. will say that's a number, though, in, in extreme situations. 
four hours is a is like a, something that you can maintain function on for a long period of time. Yeah. I know I can. Under four hours and it starts to chip away at me after a while. Yeah. But if I can sleep for four hours, I'm kind of stoked a little bit. <laughs> Cool, no, Sorry. and on a normal day, you know, like normal day to day life, I sleep like six hours, you know, because that's what the body needs. Some people it's eight, some people it's five, you know, different. Uh, Marines adversely suffering from the effects of being cold, wet, hungry, thirsty, or weary will de- will, will determine their ability to fight well. Marines tend to develop a high tolerance for enduring the extremes of weather without much support. However, there is a point where morale is affected and your unit's actual ability to fight becomes questionable. At the first opportunity, provide dry clothing, protection from the elements, food, and water. There you go. Sources of stress in combat. The following excerpt from Battle at Best by SLA Marshall describes how taking care of your Marines pays its dividends in combat. And again, we covered SLA Marshall on this podcast. I forget what number. And there's some definite concerns with the veracity of him and some of the information that he put out. But as I said, when we covered on the podcast, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. This is a really interesting case. At dark on 8 December, the snowfall ceased and the cold intensified. Down along the canyon road near the water gate, a brisk wind was piling the drifts as high as a man's head. At the battalion CP, which was partly sheltered by the canyon wall, the thermometer read 30 degrees below zero. Up on the wind-swept crags where Abel Company was clearing Chinese dead from the bunkers to make room for its own ranks, and at the same time preparing to evacuate its own casualties down the iced slopes of the mountains, it must have been a touch colder than that, though there was no reading of the temperature. All batteries had frozen. Weapons were stiffening. The camp long since had run out of water because of the freezing of canteens. To ease their thirst, the men ate snow and seemed to thrive on it. But of the many problems raised by the weather, the most severe one was getting an average good man to observe what the field manual so easily describe as a, quote, common sense precaution. For example, prior to marching, Captain Barrow of Abel made certain that each of his men carried two spare pairs of socks. But that safeguard did not of itself ensure his force, though the men with feet sweated from the rigors of the day were all at the point of becoming frostbite casualties by the hour of the bivouac. And here's here's what Captain Barrow said. I learned that night that only leadership will save men under winter conditions. It's easy to say that men should change socks. Getting it done is another matter. Boot laces become iced over during prolonged engagements in snow drifts. It's a fight to get a boot off the foot. When a man removes his gloves to struggle with the laces, it seems to him that his hands are freezing. His impulse is all against it. So I found it necessary to do this by order staying with the individuals until they had changed, then making them get up and move about to restore circulation. That process, simple in the telling, consumed hours. By the time Beryl was satisfied that his command was relatively snug, it was wearing on toward midnight. Right then his perimeter was hit by a counterattack, an enemy force in platoon strength, plus striking along the ridge line from a pro- from 1081 in approximately the same formation which Barrow had used during the afternoon. All that needs to be told of his small action is summed up in Barrow's brief radio report. They hit us, we killed them all, all that we could see. We have counted 18 fresh bodies just outside our lines. And by the way, this is Captain Barrow that became the 27th Commandant. So he had to go person to person and physically make sure they were doing exactly what he told them to do. Because the tendency is 
to curl up into a ball and die. Yeah. And you know, we, we covered uh, some of the, or, or one of the prison camps in Korea, and that, that individual specifically talked about that decision, is there was people that just, they just gave up, and they're not gonna do anything else, and they're not gonna try, and they just accepted death. Mm -hmm. And the guys that lived were the guys that said, no, I'm not gonna give up. But these little things, like, you know, your feet are sweating and your socks are wet from working all day, mm -hmm. climbing up this mountain, and then you get up there and you're gonna be up there for a while, you have to change your socks or, or else you're gonna freeze. Mm -hmm. And your ices are laced up and it's colder than 30 degrees below zero. Damn. <sighs> Here's another source of stress in combat. Casualties. Seeing a fellow Marine go down has a traumatic impact upon you and your Marines. Brutal combat is brutal and casualties are to be expected. The shock of seeing your buddies wounded or killed and the possibility that may happen to them adds to the fear and apprehension of the survivors. It increases your Marines' reluctance to take risks and obey you. How individuals respond after their unit has taken casualties is a key indicator of their effectiveness of their training, self-discipline, and preparation for combat. Proper care for your wounded has a great effect upon morale, assuring your Marines that if they are hit, their fellow Marines will take care of them. There's an unwritten code among Marines that if wounded and unable to fend for yourself, another Marine will come to your aid. And, and look, that exists in the Marine Corps, but that should exist in your team too, in your organization. Someone has a problem, someone has an issue, someone has a sick kid, someone has, they get sick themselves and you take care of them, that's going to help them. It's gonna, it's gonna bring your unit closer together. It says your Marines need to recognize that the quicker they take the objective, the quicker their fallen comrades get help. Stopping to take care of your fellow Marines during the assault will bog down the unit. During the assault, Marines cannot stop to aid a fallen comrade. The corpsman will take care of the casualties in the best possible manner until you are able to send for help. That's something we learned basically day one. Win the fight. Mm. That's also a prioritize and execute scenario. Mm -hmm. That's probably the first prioritize and execute thing that I ever learned. Mm. You gotta win the fight. Mm. At the first opportunity, leaders and comrades should look for casualties. Every Marine must be accounted for. Dead and wounded are removed from the combat area as soon as possible. And there's got a section here about boredom. In combat, the squad leader should fight inactivity and boredom with the same tenacity used against enemy troops. That might be a bit strong. <laughs> Look, I don't want my troops to be bored, but I'm going to be more tenacious against the enemy than I am against boredom. Mm -hmm. The boredom and that inactivity produces can negatively impact your squad if they become complacent. When the time comes, when the time for combat comes, this inactivity may result in a less effective unit. And there's another thing. This one thing that I think is good good to think about. If you push somebody, if you if you're giving someone something to do, kind of making almost making it up, not quite, but like, hey, we're going to run this battle drill again. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to do another briefing. Hey, we're we're going to review this. Hey, we're going to maintain our weapons again. If you're doing that kind of stuff, you should you should give them time for it. Hey, right now we got an hour. Relax. You should give them a specific amount of time to stand down, to relax, to take a knee, whatever. I think that is important too. If you're trying to keep them busy all the time, that's not smart. Mm. You need to find a moment to go, okay, hey, we got a half an hour, everybody take your, take your ruck off, relax. Yeah, see here it says, keep your Marines occupied by delivering intelligence briefs, reviewing the rules of engagement, rehearsing immediate action drills during the lulls and pace of operations. By doing so, so you prevent disciplinary problems by turning your squad's thoughts away from them, themselves to the work at hand. Again, good, yes, I like it, I agree with it. However, comma, you gotta give people a little bit of downtime. Is that kind of parallel, whatever, to uh, the idea of, you know, okay, so you go to the gym, we'll mm -hmm. say, right? So let's say you want to go to the gym after work, not before work, mm -hmm. right? After work. So if you, let's say as a routine, you go from work, you get off work, and then you go 
straight to the gym. Mm-hmm. That's better than going home first, mm-hmm. decompressing a little bit, then going to the gym, right? You know, I don't know if what you're talking about is the same thing, but it's 100% true. I think so, though, because they're, th- yep. you know, when you get like downtime or whatever, like too much downtime, essentially, right? Yeah. Like where it's not like you have to rest and recover from work to go yeah. to the gym unless you do. And that's a whole different thing. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. talking about the idea that you come home from your office, you know, and you're physically not exhausted. Maybe mentally mm-hmm. you are, but whatever. You go straight to the gym because you don't give your your mind, mm-hmm. just like I always said, a chance to think about like yourself, yeah. your yeah. own, like how am I feeling? Am I in the mood? Yeah. And it's like it kind of creeps up on you, you know, when you have that downtime. But if you go straight to the gym, you're like, hey, we're still we're still moving, you know. Yeah, you don't get a chance to. That's think true. That. that is that is accurate. And then if you take that to the extreme, where you all of a sudden you're not getting any rest at all, you don't have any downtime. Yeah. Then you gotta watch out for that. Yeah, that's almost like the idea that let's say your your job is like super physically demanding, mm-hmm. like you're a what what you what yeah. you say a drywall hanger or something. Drywall hangers getting after it. Yeah. yeah, well, that's one that you said you did. Was yeah. kind of hard. Either way, let's say you did you know eleven twelve hours of roofer. that. Let's say roofer. Roofer. Yeah, yeah. in the hot sun mm-hmm. even. Boom. Okay, go home, take a little snoozer even. Mm-hmm. Then hit the gym. You can be kind of like refreshed a little bit. I bet you'd be better off just going straight there. Though, Sometimes. Let's face it. I think so. Sometimes. I think that there's plenty of people here at our gym where they're coming off of a long day of work and construction and then it's like right onto the mats, you know? Yeah. I think that's a better move, bro. I would. I, for me, it's a better move. Mentally, it's a better move, I think. Yeah. Physically, no, you go recover a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. But you're driving here. You know, you got like a half an hour or whatever. You know, That's what I'm vehicle. saying. Mentally. But because when you're driving here, you're thinking about training mm-hmm. more than you're thinking about relaxing. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. You go home, have a snack, turn on the TV just yeah. for a little you're bit. You're letting the window you know? close. That was like one of the <laughs> better uh, conversations we once had was you're letting that window close. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's getting a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. Oh, can't make it. Oh, you know, I got a little too busy. Yep. Sometimes my wife will wake up early. And like, there's that, you know, whatever, that uh, gravity of, you know, she's, oh, you know, talking to me and stuff. (laughs) Oh, right. Yes. yes, Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we have workouts to do, (laughs) you know? (laughs) know. But yes. Or or like, I'll come back down to the house to like grab some more water or something Mm -hmm. because I'm in my garage, you know? Uh, And then I go back down to like grab some water. And she's awake, and she's like having a cup of tea because she's from England. <laughs> oh yeah! And she's like, "Oh, morning!" And I'm like, yeah. "And there's that gravity, yep. you know." Yeah, I kind of wish she. Honestly, no offense to my wife, I kind of wish she wasn't awake because I kind of want to like hang <laughs> yeah. out with her a bit, you know. Yes, and I have uh, to not. Oh yeah, that's real. That's real. Even with us, when we show up here, whatever mm. we want to talk about, some stuff, you know, mm. do this, do that. Yeah, the workout thing, especially with your wife, because there, even if you don't want to talk to your wife. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's my case. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Either way, even if you don't want to talk to her. Let's say hypothetically. Hypothetically. You can't just disrespect her mm-hmm. and be like, yeah, cool story. I'm busy. She knows what you're doing. You're yeah. working out. Take a minute. Yeah. Talk to me. I'm your wife. Yeah. You know, for better or worse, yeah. all this stuff. And you're over here just dissing me for like some f- curls or whatever <laughs> you're doing in there. You see what I'm saying? And that's what it really does feel like when you're doing it. So, yeah, I can jam you up, mm. man. I hope my wife sleeps. I like it when she. I like it when she sleeps a little later. You know, get get her rest. Yeah, get man. some rest, girl. I dig it. Get I some dig rest. Um, success in combat. The focus of this study unit is to teach you the important factors of leadership, so you can perform better as a leader in both peacetime and in combat. The way that you respond to these leadership challenges is crucial to achieving success in combat. Factors to success. As an infantry squad leader. You control the lives of 12 Marines. They look to you for instruction and guidance. This part is important. Your most casual remark will be remembered. Your clothing, vocabulary, and method of leadership will be imitated. They're listening. And it it has impact. Mm -mm. When you start making little cracking jokes about the LT, Th- those jokes have a lot more impact when they're coming from you as a squad leader. What's the LT? The lieutenant. Oh, gotcha. When you're cracking jokes about the VP of sales, <laughs> yeah. your little sales team is 
that those those have more impact than you think. I, this is something I always had to like be careful to. When I went from being, maybe it's even to this day, when I went from, from being an E5 in a platoon, E5 mafia, where everybody's a target, mm. everybody in the entire chain of command is a target for ridicule. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when I became, you know, like an officer, assistant platoon commander, platoon commander, I had to freaking dial that back. You know, yeah. you just can't be going dropping napalm on the <laughs> chain of command over yeah. every little thing. Yeah. And it's tempting because it's funny and that's yeah. what you're used to. I had to dial that back. Leif always cracks up when I like go E5 on somebody, you know, yeah. I start dropping the hammer on someone. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is a side note. Okay, so you always talk about that, like the E5. Yep. It's like a thing. Yeah. E5 Mafia. E5 and, Mafia. And I've heard of right. E4, uh-huh. or I think. Um, yeah. E and then E6, of course. Yeah. What's with E5? That sounds, to me, that sounds pretty high. Like, there's E1, right? Is there an E1? Yeah, there's E1, but you're not an E1 for very long. You're like okay. in boot camp, you're an E1. You're probably going to make E2 out of boot camp. Sure. E3, you should be pretty much, you know, within maybe, I don't know, a year. Yeah. Then you're E4. Mm-hmm. So now you could be E4 for like a few, a couple of years, you know, maybe two, three years. So you're, you, you, may, you may or may not have done a deployment. And this is also back in the day. Guys make rank faster now than we did. Yeah. So back in the day, the, the E6 was a leadership position. Okay. E5 was the boys, and the new guys were kind of E4s, gotcha. maybe even E3s occasionally. So. Essentially, I don't think there's an E3 in a SEAL platoon today at all. Okay. I don't think there is. I think there. I, I think there's barely any E4s. It's mostly E5s, and now you'll have multiple E6s in a platoon. But back in the day, mm. an E6 was an LPO. He was the leading petty officer. Then you had a chief petty officer. Then you had the assistant platoon commander and the platoon commander. So you had th- those were the senior people. We yeah. called them the top four. And then you had new guys, you had four or five new guys, mm-hmm. which were probably E3s. No, they were probably E4s, maybe an E3. And then you had the group in the middle. Right. Those and these the were the E5 mob. So they were they're not, when you say they're E6 leadership position, so E5 is not a lead, like they're not anyone's boss. They're just, they're just the, the, the right. guys. Now they, they, they might be one, per, they might be a new guy's boss. Like when I was an E5 mobster, I had an E4 that was a new guy that was a radio man. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm trying to trying to draw a comparison. And actually, part of the time understand. I was an E5 Mafia, I was an E4. Yeah. Because I didn't make E5 very rapidly. Yeah. So, yeah. But that E5 Mafia is like the people that are doing the work. Right, right. Like when you were a bouncer, how many bouncers were there? Uh, I don't know. 15. 20. Okay. This is it. Yeah. Now, one of them was in charge, right? Yeah. Maybe two of them. Hey, this guy's in charge yeah, of the one, shift or two, whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So those guys are in charge of the shift. Then you had a couple like n- new guys that yeah. kind of sucked or whatever. Yeah. But then you had a core group of guys that kind of, if you could say something, yeah. people are going to have to listen. Yeah. There sure. you go. That's yeah. your E5 Mafia. Yeah. You know what it was? And now that I'm thinking of it, it's there's the door guys. They're all called door guys, but mm-hmm. they're the guys who work the front door, mm-hmm. which is usually the one and two. And then like a, a kind of a guys who would switch out, mm-hmm. someone who's doing well. Mm-hmm. But, and then there's the rest of the guys who worked, you know, inside. And then, yes, there were like new guys who were yeah, like yeah. still learning. Kind of like, and, hey, bro. <laughs> yeah, who, yes. It, and kind of the same thing where you could tell them, hey, go change the toilet yeah. paper in the bathroom, yeah. you know? Like go do yeah. the worst. New guy. You, yeah, exactly right. So yeah, I, get, I got you. Yeah. But so, E5 is kind of high though, is what I'm saying. It's it, like. N- well, I can tell, no, it's not kind of high. Mm. But in a SEAL platoon, you're a mid-level, but you're kind of just a shooter too. You know, you don't, you're not one of the top four. So it's not like kind of high. And right now, everybody, I think, I think everybody in the SEAL teams right now is an E5. If you make it through buds, I think you become an E5. It's kind of legit, you know? Back in the day, he was like, no, sorry, bro, you're an E3, (laughs) you're an E4. Uh, Back in the day, if you were on a ship and you were an E3, you had to work in the dishwashing for three months. Dang. And we did one deployment. We had an E3 in our platoon, and we somehow got him out of it. <laughs> got him out of doing that. But I was an E4 for my second platoon. So even though I should have been an E5, or I, I was in the E5 Mafia, but I was an E4. But even then, even in that platoon, 
there's a bunch of E4s, and we were all in the E5 Mafia. What does E stand for? <laughs> Enlisted. Enlisted. And then if you're an officer, it's an O. So you got O1, oh. that's an ensign. O2 oh. oh, is lieutenant junior grade. See, that's oh. weird. I've never heard of O anything. Mm-hmm. All I heard was E. I think I've even heard of E1, E2, E3. E- yeah, because people talk smack about the O. <laughs> like, oh, that guy's an E1. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and then you become, an, in the Navy, O3 is lieutenant, and then O4 is lieutenant commander. But in the army, that same rank is called a major. Mm. So when we in Ramadi, the army guys, they would, a lot of army guys would call me major, right? Mm-hmm. So then some of the, some of my guys would call me the mage. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so there you go. And then captain isn't very high or it is high? Captain in the army and the Marine Corps is an O4. Captain, or sorry, is an O3 in the Army and the Marine Corps, which is a company commander in charge of 150 guys. A mm. uh, uh, captain in the Navy is much higher. It's an O6, and they could be in charge of multiple ships. Mm. So a captain in the Navy is much higher rank than a captain in the Army or the Marine Corps. Okay. A captain in the Navy is a colonel. A full bird, you ever heard that expression? Mm-hmm. Probably in the movies you hear that full no, bird from, colonel. From you guys, so a full bird colonel, yeah. which means they have an eagle on their collar, yeah. is a full captain. Huh. Like, you don't really say full bird captain because you don't need to. Yeah. Because the reason you say that is in the Army and the Marine Corps, you could be a lieutenant colonel, which still has a silver oak leaf, which makes you a lieutenant colonel. So if someone's got the full bird, that's why you, because you can still call someone that's a lieutenant colonel, you might just call them colonel. Because you're not, it's a big mouthful to say colonel. Mm. Or sorry, it's a big mouthful to say lieutenant colonel. Hey, lieutenant colonel, what are we doing? But if you say, hey, colonel, that's totally acceptable. (laughs) So we want to let your boys know like, hey, this guy's a full bird colonel. Mm. Big deal. Got that full bird colonel coming in. (laughs) Yeah, I I understand why. I understand now why I was so unclear about everything. Because it's like a lot same of stuff words, going on. different, you yeah. know, Army's different than Navy, and it, but same words, you know. Yeah. Well, sometimes Leif and Seth would get called captain by Army guys, by Marine, because that's, you see those two bars, like, oh, that's a captain. If you're in the Army, that's a captain. Yeah. So you're not thinking lieutenant, because the lieutenant is a lower rank. Yeah. Huh. Check. All right. This section breaks out two things. There are two fundamental types of of factors that affect success in combat. One, factors over which you have little or no influence that you must try to understand, endure, and explain to your Marines. And number two, factors that you can influence directly through your leadership. And it goes into a bunch of things. Well, that you can't, that you have little to no influence, political guidelines and rules of engagement, available, available, Ability and quality of replacements, location, weather, terrain, public reaction and support, type of conflict, enemy action, duration. You don't have control, very little control over those things. And it goes into talking about the political guidelines, what you're responsible, making sure your Marines abide by them. Here's an important part. They say, pass through the chain of command information that might be useful in correcting deficiencies with rules of engagement procedures. So if you've got some rule of engagement that doesn't make sense, you are responsible for sending that up chain of command. And by the way, if you work in a factory and there's some part of the manufacturing line that doesn't make sense, you are responsible for running that up the chain so it can get corrected. Little control over who's gonna replace you, obviously, no control, very little control over location, terrain, weather. So it, it lists, goes into a little bit of detail on those things, and then it goes into factors that you can influence. Morale, motivation, discipline, esprit de corps, proficiency. Morale is the mental and emotional condition, enthusiasm, confidence or loyalty of an individual or group with regard to the functions or tasks at hand. The squad leader who taps into this valuable resource and keeps it to the forefront throughout the adverse conditions of combat will always prevail. That's a strong word, always. Mm -hmm. Motivation is a byproduct of morale. 
If your Marines are enthusiastic about being part of the squad and have confidence in their squad leader, then they will have the incentive to drive on through adversity. Discipline. Discipline is defined in the dictionary as, quote, to bring under control. In combat, we speak of discipline. In troops, we speak of the Marines' ability to disregard the natural tendencies of self-preservation and at times put them in harm's way if necessary. And I would expand on this right now, but they expand on this in a beautiful way. They'll talk about discipline in a beautiful way coming up. Esprit de corps is the unit spirit. Describes how devoted and loyal they are to the team. Proficiency. Proficiency is being knowledgeable and skillful in your craft. Craft. Imagine a unit being so confident in their ability to perform that it affects all of the aforementioned factors. Now you have a unit ready to fight. Morale and motivation is the cornerstone of discipline. Esprit de corps and proficiency. If you instill high morale and motivation in your Marines, this can lead to success in combat. Morale makes up three quarters of the game. The relative balance of manpower makes up only the remaining quarter. That's Napoleon Bonaparte. Morale makes up three quarters of the game in combat. Mm. You know, that's one of those ones you go, well, yeah. Because, you know, if you're thinking, you know, your football team against another football team and they have great morale, but you guys are better players, yeah, right? Well, it's probably not going to work out too well. But because this is what I was thinking about last night. I was like, well, you know, what is that going to really carry you mm-hmm. in a football game? Mm-hmm. But then I thought, what if you what if your football game was played for months? Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it wasn't about how big and strong you were, but it was about, hey, we're going to be we're going to maneuver faster than you. We're going to walk further than you. We're going to keep working while you're resting. Like though we're gonna keep our weapons clean, like all those things. Like that's how you win. Yeah. And all those things have to do with morale. So it might not make a sense in a short engagement in a physical game. It can have an impact, for sure. I would almost say you were right to begin with in a football game. As mm-hmm. far as the example, I mean, you're right either way. But if your morale is low, the other team is high, but you have a better football team. Your morale is going to be low for a reason. Like, base, essentially, like, oh, you know, it's like there's going to be in low morale. It's going to be a lack of confidence, I'm sure. I'm, there's going to be a lack of motivation. And I'm according sure. to the book, lack of proficiency, which negatively affects your morale. So when yeah. you know you're not that good, your morale's down. Exactly right. Yeah. So, like yeah. I said, it's for a reason. So their morale is good. What if, like, every, your morale, if you're a better, quote unquote, better football team, mm-hmm. is going to be for a reason? Mm-hmm. And then whatever that reason is, I don't know. It's your hypothetical. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. But think of a realistic one. Maybe. People are arguing about this and that, so they're not working together as a team. Oh, the morale or, on the team itself? Like, what can hurt the morale? Exactly right. Like, on the better, quote-unquote, quote unquote, team. Yeah, like you lo- like you blew a game. Like you blew the last game, like you shouldn't have missed the field goal, and you did, and you were a better team than them, but yeah. then they won. Morale can be down. Yeah, and you're arguing with your team. Quarterbacks yeah. is blaming everyone. They, mm-hmm. you know, maybe their best guy is injured, and that, you know, now everyone's not as confident, mm-hmm. and, like, maybe they're starting, you know, all this other stuff, and they're tired because they've been drinking, you know, all this stuff. So technically, there, there's a, I'm just saying that's that's a big factor a lot of time. So, <laughs> so technically, they they are maybe a better team, but the morale is so low for these specific reasons. The other guys, they've been working hard. Yeah. They even got a strategy in yeah. place, a secret strategy. I told you about this one time. This team was we were technically better than them, but they were like saying, "Oh, we're gonna kick their ass. We're gonna kick their ass," and they're telling the whole island essentially, mm-hmm. "We're gonna kick their ass." Wait, so what, bad. Was this was this high school? High school? Yeah. And I was like, what the, this is uncanny the, re, the way they're saying this so much, you know? And then, but they had a little plan and they did, they beat us too with a plan. What was the plan? It was uh, to do qu- these weird quarterback keep plays mm-hmm. with no huddle. Mm. So it's just essentially that ascent, uh, that surprise kind of mm-hmm. thing. And then just keep going, going, going. So they'd go quarterback keep and we'd kind of stop it. Then they go, no huddle quarterback keep and we'd be like, oh, oh we're scrambling. And we kind of stop it, but they gain a little bit more and they just kept doing it, kept doing it for and the whole. But didn't you figure out a solution for it after they did it four or seven or nine times? I think or was it too I late? think our morale went down oh. in that first flurry, to be honest with you. Um, I forget how it. So their morale was high. Very high. And they actually beat you. Yeah. For that reason. I'm though. always surprised in football that there's not more sneakiness. Yeah. 
I think a lot of sneakiness and I feel like we might have talked about this too. With football, there's so much history behind the way plays work Mm -hmm. that sneakiness usually comes with an element of risk that's equal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you do a trick play, like there's a there's teams that sort of lend towards more sneakiness, but Mm -hmm. they lend more towards risk as well. Mm -hmm. So, like one of the mainstream sneaky plays is called the reverse, where it's like you give the ball – there's many ways to do it, but a standard one would be you give the ball to the running back in an outside run. Mm-hmm. And instead of keeping running, the, the wide receiver who's way over there, he comes around this way. So he's acting like he's running and he gives it to the wide receiver going the other going way. The other so the defense has all this momentum going this way with the ball, and the reverse just comes around with – but he's a single guy because mm-hmm. he has no blockers. Yeah. If he had blockers, everyone would see the blockers going over there, and they'd be like, oh, wait, this isn't, you know, this." so they'd be wearing The risk being momentum. that if somebody picks it up and reads the play, then he's getting to, um, annihilated. Probably behind the line because yeah. he has no blockers. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Or the what's the one? That, um, there's like a hook and lateral, which mm-hmm. has a big risk on that one. And then uh, a, a pass back to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. That's another one. Mm-hmm. Where, like, you give it to the running back, and he runs, and he doesn't go past the line. The quarterback's. Does no, the quarterback runs around the other side on a on a pass pattern essentially a receiver so he goes down and the, then now the running back has to throw yeah. the ball to the quarterback which is huge risk by huge the way risk. bro they're gonna pick that thing and off. the quarterback got to catch it got to catch <laughs> it he has to be open yeah. by the way because if he's not open who's he gonna throw it to another wide receiver Check. usually it's like you know it's like you put your eggs all in one basket a lot of the time and then nowadays people are kind of hip to trick plays so they kind of wait for it to develop mm-hmm. and now the risk goes up you know so that's probably why i'm sure back in the in fact sure what back in the day like 1940s football mm-hmm. right so all kinds of weird all plays. kinds of trick plays yeah so morale mm-hmm. you guys lost the other p- platoon team was hyped on their morale your morale was immediately crushed and then you were all embarrassed then you just lost <laughs> so even even in football it can be morale can be um, three quarters of the game. Yeah, I think so. It says morale is the confident, re- resolute, willing, and often sa- self-sacrificing and courageous attitude of a Marine to accomplish the tasks expected by the squad. Morale is based upon pride in the achievement and aims of the squad, faith in you as a squad leader, a sense of participation in the squad's work, devotion and loyalty to the other members of the squad, confidence in the ultimate success of the squad. Whichever army goes into battle stronger in soul, their enemies generally cannot withstand them. That's the Greek warrior Xenophon more than 2,000 years ago. Morale tends to fluctuate even among the best Marines. It must be your constant concern because it is the foundation of discipline. You must recognize the extreme importance morale has to the combat effectiveness of your squad. Marine tends uh, or morale tends to fluctuate even amongst the best Marines. That's something that's important to note. I'll, I'll tell you, it affect it 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 fluctuates less. It can't fluctuate, mm. but man, you get some some motivated troopers. <laughs> it's hard to even it's hard to even bring them down a little bit. They're yeah. just in the game, and they help everybody. It's so helpful to have somebody kind of motivated in the game, like somebody with high morale. Yeah. Like, we got this. And it, it kind of takes someone who can deal with adversity, right? Yeah. So, and I was thinking. Which, by the way, is a decision. Yeah. You but know, and it's a learned decision, it, too. Yeah. You can be like, look, I know what's happening right now. I can see what's happening. I can see the negativity start to drag down. Yeah. And you can say, hey, well, I'm not letting this happen. On me, yeah. and you get crazy. So, but that guy who's getting crazy, and uh-huh. your ki- um, <laughs> he has to be kind of used to adversity in one way or another, or at the very least, know how to deal with it. That's what. Yes. So, the, so it kind of brought me back a little bit to the to a conversation we had recently about guys quitting who you whatever it may be, mm-hmm. um, where you would think no way this guy's gonna quit because mm-hmm. he's he's a stud, but. This guy's probably not. You, you get in, you know, in MMA and well, sports yeah, so and whatever. In Dick Marcinko's book, who recently died, The Rogue Warrior, he wrote a book, came out in 1992 when I was a new guy in the yeah, yeah. But he called these people gazelles. Right, yes, yeah. And he said gazelles, they, they're used to winning. Yeah. 
they're run, they run and they win and they run and they win and they're just good athletes and they're just winning, winning, winning. Mm-hmm. And they show up at buds and you, I can promise you, there's gonna be some shit you lose. Yeah. <laughs> and if and if that's you, know, you hit that adversity wall and you've been a stud your whole life and all of a sudden, it, I'm sure there's multiple psychological things that can unfold. One of them might be oh, you, I'm, you're used to winning and now you lose and you get down on yourself. But also, hey. This, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's harder than I thought it was going to be. Or I failed this thing, and now what's going to happen? If I failed this thing, and I'm only two days into this gig, I got six more months of this, yeah. and I Can't I already it. failed. No, I'm not. I'm not cut out for this. Yeah, I'm not totally not used yeah. to it. It's totally like an imposition on their whole sensibility, and that's just how just not used to it. But so you could, in a way, kind of track it back to morale, mm-hmm. really. That, where, mor- that, that, that individual's morale gets crushed. Exactly right. Like cru- So you get a guy who's used to adversity. He's like, hey, this won't crush my ra- morale. I've been here before. Mm-hmm. I know I can fight back out yep. of this. I yep. know this is going to end. I know that you know guys who know about mm-hmm. adversity. But the guy who doesn't, the guy who mm-hmm. wins every single time, never mm-hmm. failed ever. In his, th- you know, ju- and just things come natural to him. Yeah. Oh, bro, you let that guy get crushed one time. Yeah. Morale is down. Yeah. He's down. Damn. So that might the be the, the situation on that one. Could be. So morale is kind of, because in the beginning, you'd think morale, that's just you having a bad attitude about stuff. Your morale is low. Like if, let's oh, yeah. say, oh, hey, bad my morale, morale is bad. You know, mm-hmm. I don't have a good. You're kind of on the surface. Mm-hmm. It kind of comes off as that. Like, bro, just, I don't know, fire yourself up. Like, mm-hmm. basically, essentially, like, make a decision to have a better attitude. What almost. do you think about this? The the buds, when I was going through buds, they would say false motivation is better than no motivation. Yeah. Uh, yeah I yeah. kind of agreed with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, like, you hear yeah. someone start getting fired up, whether they're faking it or not, it's like, yeah. hey, that guy seems to be stoked. Let's go rock and roll. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. And that's a, And you know how, um like, you guys will say like, hey, if you have like the 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 no bad teams, only bad mm-hmm. leaders, right? The boat cruise, right? Where you get a guy who's who's kind of like, hey, it's all good, guys. We're gonna do this, and and he's kind of motivating everybody, mm-hmm. even if they were kind of like beat down. Yeah, they, their morale kind of gets gets more high. On the academy online the other day, I was talking about f- how you frame things up, and this is a skill mm. that you can attain over time, but. If you gave, if you were my boss and you gave me the worst assignment ever, yeah. by the time I'm telling the team, I frame that thing up in a totally different way. <laughs> it is yes, not sir. the worst job. It's yeah. a challenge. It's an yeah. opportunity to look awesome. We're gonna do better than everybody. It's like the, I'm gonna frame things up all day long yeah. in an uplifting morale moment. Yeah, I'm definitely not framing something up as bad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like we're gonna Probably frame not. this up. And the thing is, it's not a lie. It's the truth. I can't, you can't lie to your team. You can't lie to them and be like, well, hey, everyone, this is going to be great. We just, hey, everyone, we got to work this weekend. Aren't you excited? You know, if you've just been out in the field for two weeks and then you get back and the boss says, hey, you guys got to do a dog and pony this weekend. What do you mean? Oh, we got a congressman coming in and we got to show him our new capabilities and your platoon's doing it. Mm -hmm. Right, you yeah, can't oh, yeah. be like, "Hey, everyone, this is jump right. for joy." No, but you can, but you can frame it in a true way. That's listen up. Hey, the boss just talked to me. They want the best platoon out here to represent and do this dog and pony. We're gonna do. We're gonna knock this guy's socks off. Yeah. He's gonna think that every seal is a damn Terminator robot when he gets <laughs> done walking through this stuff. We're gonna get more money oh, for yeah. the entire community by yeah. kicking ass. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a yes, different sir. game. I'm fired up right now. I'm ready to do a dog and pony show for a congressman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, you got to frame stuff correctly. Like your kids, if they don't like math, mm-hmm. right? you can't be like, no, math is fun. Mm-hmm. But you just that's, lied to that's them a lot. in there yeah. for yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. They're like, that's okay, I, I can't really yeah. relate to you at all. I can't Not to mention you. my trust level is going down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like even a five-year-old knows that this is not fun. Yeah. Right? Exactly. exactly. There's a rare person that thinks it's fun, but it's like one in a billion. <laughs> Freaking Lex Friedman just got fired up looking <laughs> right. at a problem when he's six years old. He's like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. Me, not happening. No, Lex, no. good to go. You needed a better frame up on that one. Yeah. Like Lex framed it up in his mind. That's his good frame yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, no, but when you say, hey, when you get good at this right here, it's going to make you smarter. Yeah. This is, you're going to be able to dominate. Yeah. You're not going to have to worry about school when you're dominant in math. 
you gotta learn this problem. And people are like, oh, I can dominate you. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Characteristics of morale. Major General William Slim, quoted by John Masters in the Road Pass, the Road Pass Mandalaya, provides an example of how morale can be affected in combat. Again, some of these, these things are really good. <clears throat> Quote, we have already trained our men to the highest possible level of skill with their weapons and in the use of minor tactics. But in the end, every important battle develops to a point where there is no real control by senior commanders. Every soldier feels himself to be alone. Discipline may have got him to the place where he is, and discipline may hold him there for a time. Cooperation with other men in the same situation can help move him forward. Self-preservation will make him defend himself to the death if there is no other way. But what makes him go on alone, determined to break the will of the enemy opposite him, is morale. Pride in himself as an independent thinking man who knows why he's there and what he's doing. Absolute confidence that the best has been done for him and that his fate is now in his own hands. The dominant feeling on the battlefield is loneliness, gentlemen, and morale, only morale, individual morale as a foundation under training and discipline will bring victory. And that's, see, that's what's important. What, what oh, I read this a couple times. What's important here is to remember that as the leader, you're the one that's developing their morale. Mm. You're bringing together that unit. You're training them to the utmost. You're, you're, impo- you're imparting this, the benefits of self-discipline. You're rewarding those things. And you build this creature, this, this beast, that has this morale that's so strong that they're not going down. Here's some specific indicators of morale. Response to shortages, care of equipment and weapons, rumors, excessive quarreling. You brought that one up earlier with the football team. Mm -hmm. Personal hygiene, standards of military courtesy, personal appearance, personal conduct. So, like, the, the response to is, how do they respond with, hey, we're almost out of water? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the movie Aliens? Yes, sir. We're all going to die out here, man. <laughs> right? Because there's a shortage of whatever. Mm-hmm. We don't know if any backup's coming. Oh, we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. That's bad morale. So bad morale is essentially the beginning of the end. Yeah. So it's kind of like the end of the rope kind of a thing. Of mm-hmm. course, you can turn it around, but, bro, it's the beginning of the end. Oh, no. Kind of a critical factor. When there's when there it says this here when they're running when you're running low on whatever on on equipment or food or water it says the squad with high morale and strong unit cohesion will divide what is available and become an even stronger outfit because of it. The unit does, that does not have this quality is not acting cohesively as a team and will disintegrate quickly. Failure to properly maintain equipment and weapons indicate that a Marine does not care, is becoming excessively fatigued, or has lost all discipline. On the other hand, if you fail to provide the means to keep your Marines gear properly maintained, you can erode their morale. You got rumors, clearly, there's a lack of information. You, you, you need to tell your team what's going on, otherwise they're gonna make it up and it's not gonna be good. Cooperation, mutual trust, and confidence in one another's ability can be adversely affected when your Marines quarrel amongst themselves. Excessive quarreling is a sign that something is wrong and must be fixed. I was gonna say, this is like a chicken or an egg thing. Mm. Like, when things start going bad, people start to argue. Yeah. And when people start to argue, things start going bad. Mm. I guess it's, not, it's a downward spiral. I don't know which one starts first, chicken or the egg. Right. But when you start hearing people arguing amongst themselves, you're going to have problems. Yeah. And it's not going to get better. Yeah. Uh, keeping it, you know, keeping it clean as far as hygiene goes. It says, regardless of how miserable the circumstances may actually be, we must do what we can to make conditions habitable. It talks about this 
Standards of military courtesy. Units that have pride and confidence in their leaders maintain high standards of military courtesy at all times. Changes show that poor discipline and lack of respect may indicate low morale. Keeping it professional. It's interesting that they talk about standards of military courtesy, but if you want to translate that to the civilian world, you want to translate it to your family, it's how you treat each other. Because sure, in the Marine Corps, a salute means, you know, I respect you or calling you sir or whatever, staying attention, all those things. But when you're a civilian, if you want to keep your team's morale high, even when things are going sideways, mm-hmm. you don't yell at your team, you treat them with respect, you ask them what their ideas are. You know, like that's what you do. So mm-hmm. treating people with respect is a way to maintain high morale. It says this about personal conduct, moodiness, sullenness, quiet withdrawal, or any sudden unexplainable change in one of your Marines' behavior may may indicate that something is wrong and there's cause for concern. That's the way you're acting. Mm. Now listen, does that mean you want to be Pollyanna and have a big smile on your face? Hey guys, we're about to be overrun. Yay. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about. Hey, I'm going to have to fire a bunch of people from our company. Mm -hmm. No. But going into that, listen to the, it's, it's, it's interesting that they say this, sullenness and quiet withdrawal and moodiness. Mm. So none of those say be happy. Mm. They don't say that. Mm. None of them say jump for joy. But if you're acting sullen, mm. if, you're, if, you, if you withdraw, if you have an unexplained change in your behavior, man, being consistent is so important from a leadership perspective. Yeah. That's why you know I was getting interviewed a little while ago and they were asking me about resiliency. And I kind of said that um, this was this was Travis Mannion's sister, Ryan. Yeah. And she was she was she's got a podcast about resiliency and I was on it. And she was asking me about resiliency and I was like, "Hey, I don't think too much about it." And I think it's kind of a little bit natural for me to be resilient. And I shouldn't have said natural, or maybe I didn't say it, but I, but that's the feeling I get. But what I ultimately said was, listen, I feel like I'm fairly resilient because I don't have low lows. And the reason I don't have low lows because I don't have high highs. Mm. I'm not getting all excited, but yay. No, I'm not mm. doing that. Mm. But I'm also like, oh no, I'm not doing either one of those two things. Mm. I'm staying in a, in a limited emotional box where I'm not g- getting too crazy with a victory and I'm not getting too crazy with a defeat. Mm. So I think that's a, this, that lines up very well with this. If you're, at, if, you, if you're the person that shows how happy you are, mm. everybody's used to that. And now when you start being sad, they're gonna go, oh geez, Echo's all bummed out, something's wrong. Yeah, or even not as happy. Mm-hmm. Like if, you know, these guys are super fired up and then, you know, Something cool happens, and then they're like, "Yeah, right on." And they're not as fired up. You're like, "Oh, something's wrong." Even though they essentially express happiness, just not enough mm. happiness. You ever um kind of back to the the um professionalism, and mm-hmm. you know they're talking about in the military, like, okay, so uh, what what does your wife call you normally, darling? Darling. Not by your name, huh? Not generally. Yeah. No, barely ever, actually. Yeah, mine either. And I don't even oh. really call her by her name that much. It's mm. some other stuff. We yeah. don't have to go into it. But I don't want to hear the weird <laughs> things. <laughs> Sometimes if, I'll, if I call her by a name, she'll be like, don't call me by my name. Like kind of half oh. joking, you know, because it kind of sounds neat. But also, what if, what, if she, what if you were downstairs and she was like, Echo. Right, you know exactly right. Wrong. Or if if we're going through some things, or in yeah, some sort yeah. of a, almost like an argument or whatever, like yeah, she won't. She'll. Thankfully, it's been multiple, multiple, multiple years it's since anything like that. But even then, let's say you're on bad terms with your wife, and usually she calls you, I don't know, darling, babe, mm-hmm. whatever they call we call each other, and then they call you your name. You kind of it's like a little assault mm-hmm. on your set, like kind of like oh, there's something wrong. So when morale is down, yeah. boom, you kind of, that part breaks down yeah, a little it's, bit. It's a little bit disrespectful. Yeah, to call you by your own name. Yeah. So that's that's it. Yeah. That's why consistency yeah. and keeping yourself in check and making sure that you're not allowing these emotions to creep out yeah. and cause people to look at you and think, oh, Echo's really concerned right now. This Things are going bad. Yeah. Echo's all sullen right now. Things you know, that's what's going to spread. 
Yeah. That's going to affect the morale of everybody. What's with that with calling someone who you know good by their legitimate name? What that is, you know how like okay, so in the family, you know the old thing where if they call you like the parent calls the kid by their first and last name. Oh yeah, yeah. You know yeah, that yeah, that yeah, means they're like, in trouble, like that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, I think it's because of what we're saying right now. Yeah. I think it's like a step up in in in. Lack of affection. Yeah, it's like almost the opposite, you know, in a small, tiny way where it's like the better terms we're on, the more loose I'm going to be with what I call you. I'll call mm-hmm. you more of like fun stuff, mm-hmm. you know. I'll call you by a nickname yeah. or a fun name or a pet name, whatever you call it. And then when things are bad, okay, now you're kind of reduced to your legitimate name, your official name. Okay, let me ask you this. Tangential, but if you ever hear people when they use your name a lot when they're talking to you? Yeah. It's weird, right? It is weird, yes, sir. It's like we're trying to establish a weird salesy type like thing where I know you. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you know Echo? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think I've, other than saying good evening, Echo, I don't think I've ever said your name on this podcast because it's, it's a little bit weird, right? Yeah, I mean, and even when you do, you say my first and my last name, with in, which indicates like a small, like, it's like humor, like a joke oh, like almost. Echo Charles yeah. is here. Echo Charles, yeah, exactly right. But even you'll be like you, Echo Charles. Like mm. it's a joke. Oh, you know, you know where I do say some names on this specific podcast is if someone else is here and we're having a three-way conversation, yeah. I might say like, well, if I was to say to you, hey, Mike, or I might say, right. well, that's right, you know, Fred, because yeah. I want everyone that's listening to know that I was saying that to Fred. Yeah, but that's different than what you're talking it about. It is different. It is, it, I've always, it seems a little bit strange. It seems like something you would learn at like a, at like a, a, a mastermind sales course <laughs> to like touch them on the shoulder and yeah. tell say their name a bunch so right. they feel closer to you. It yeah. doesn't do that for me. If you're trying to sell me something, don't say my name because it's probably gonna like send me the other direction. Yeah, it's not natural. Like it doesn't feel natural no. at all. But some people, that's just how, that's just how they talk. Yeah, but I think that's because they've been ingrained to do that. I don't think it's normal. Yeah. Almost like it's like overly professional almost. Yeah. That's the thing, Echo, is when you're doing something. <laughs> See, brother, right? It's that made so me weird. feel kind of uncomfortable. It's so Dude, weird, honestly. right? Yeah. It's weird, Echo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm glad I confirmed that. It is confirmed. It's weird. If you listen yes, to podcasts, you can hear people do that sometimes. If you listen to podcasts, you'll hear someone saying, you know, and it's yeah. sort of like, uh, that's kind of strange. Yeah, especially when it's when they're the only. Yeah, two yeah, there. yeah. We're the only ones yeah. here. Echo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, or if you're scolding, I just wore out that joke if, in five if, attempts. If you're scolding someone, then mm. it then it rolls out. That's like, true. Like, I bet you some of those scolding videos that we have of you and me, I probably use your name more often than no, not. I think I use your name. Oh, right? really? Because you're not scolding. You're just trying to make fun. Okay. I think Check. I don't know if I remember correctly. Appearances. If a marine begins to look sloppy, a behavioral problem may be the cause. Likewise, if conditions prevent your marines from washing, shaving, or obtaining clean uniforms for prolonged periods, morale can drop. This is one of those things where, again, in the business world, some, hey, here's our dress code. Mm. Hey, we got a pre- presentation, you're gonna get look sharp. Smart move, smart move. Hey, and I can tell you, I'm not one of these people that is uh, going out and getting whatever, whatever a tailor <laughs> to make my suit or whatever. Yeah. In fact, I don't really like wearing suits at all. Sometimes fighters wear suits. Have you noticed that? Oh yeah, that's old. Why school. is that? The boxers. No, no, like, no, no, no. I'm not talking. I'm talking UFC. Yeah, I know, but the, it kind of, or it felt, it feels like it came from the old school, the boxers, yeah. right? I feel like I might be disconnected, like and wrong or whatever. Yeah. You know, like I, I look at a bo- I look at a fighter and they're putting a suit and tie on to go to a press conference. Yeah. I feel like in a million years I, I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. But I do think there's kind of two camps on that. Mm-hmm. And then there's a rare few that are kind of in between where so, some guys, they, that's their jam. Mm-hmm. They wear suits because they're, they're a quote unquote sophisticated mm-hmm. professional mm-hmm. and that, or that's the image. And then there's guys like Nick Diaz, who's, you know, just as good, yeah. if not better than everyone who will probably <laughs> never wear a suit. So. 
Yeah. It's I think there's two camps for yeah, sure. Yeah, there's definitely two camps. I fall into Nate Diaz camp on that one. Yes. I'm just going in a t shirt to the press conference. Yeah, probably showing sure. up late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could show up. Yeah. But you're like that in real life too though. Where yeah. you know, you you're probably gonna wear slippers or flip flops yeah, as we call them here. Yeah. And shorts mm-hmm. and a shirt. Unless you have to wear something else. Yeah, that's true. So watch out for that with your people. That's a that's a kind of a classic thing too, though, right? Like even in the movies, where it's like if they want to indicate visually that this guy has just let himself go, his mm. morale is down, he's down and mm. out. Yeah. What his beard, unshaven, unshaven. yeah, his clothes yeah. may or may not be dirty, There's like that kind, you know, type. Yeah, uh, characteristics of motivation. Motivation answers the question: Why do Marines fight? Motivation is based on a psychological factors such as needs, desires, and impulses that cause a person to act. For a Marine. Commitment and pride in the unit and the core is generally the basis for combat motivation. I was when I was starting to read this chapter, I was like thinking about the fact that I always say motivation no factor mm. because motivation is a feeling; it's fickle, it comes and goes. Mm. And then I, so I was thinking, okay, well, how what are they, how are they going to talk about this? And there you go. And I've talked about this on the podcast. Motivation is why you're doing something. Mm. And it's important to understand the why. A motivated Marine will do what needs to be done and will know the right thing to do. With effective leadership and attentive concern for maintaining high morale, motivation will also be high. However, motivation is much more than just an indicator of morale. It is a key element that must be understood by everyone in your squad. In combat, motivation has special significance to Marines. S.E. Smith's U.S. Marine Corps in World War II provides an illustration of this motivation. Quote, in a foxhole, in the center of the tenuous line, he had done much to hold. PFC John Ahrens, an able company automatic rifleman, lay quietly, his eyes closed, breathing slowly. Ahrens was covered with blood. He was dying. Next to him laid a dead Japanese sergeant and flung across his legs a dead Japanese officer. Aaron's had been hit in the chest twice by bullets, and blood welled slowly from three deep puncture wounds inflicted by bayonets. Around his foxhole sprawled 13 crumpled Japanese bodies. As Captain Lewis W. Walt gathered Aaron's into his arms to carry him to the residency, the dying man still clinging to his BAR, said, Captain, they tried to come over me last night, but I don't think they made it. They didn't, Johnny, Walt softly replied. They didn't. End quote. And then it goes on to say, what will motivate your Marines to fight like PFC Arends? What causes them to have this measure of tenacity and the ability to continue to fight when others would give up? Numerous historians, sociologists, and psychologists have studied behavior under fire in an effort to under to find out why we fight as we do in explaining what motivates a Marine to per- persevere in battle. Many experts have concluded that the following facts are significant. Unit cohesion, tradition, commitment, aggression, patriotism, rewards and punishment, social identity. In the unit cohesion section, It says, cohesion is perhaps the most powerful motivational factor in combat. Common experiences and shared hardships stimulate and foster closeness among individuals as a unit. The result in a unit that is able to maintain tactical cohesion and achieve success in combat. If your Marines know their mission, it is their faith in you and their fellow Marines that will carry them over the top, charging into the teeth of the enemy. This is, I'll get asked a lot about, you know, how do you bring a team together? It's like, you got to do hard things together. Mm. So it's one thing that's cool about the FTX program that we run. It's, mm. it's challenging. Mm. <laughs> it is mentally challenging. There's actually almost no physical challenge. So that's not what I'm talking about. It is mentally challenging. Yeah. And you will, 
you will get put in situations where you have to make very tough decisions under pressure. And when you get to do it yourself and then you watch someone else do it and they do a call or a bad call or a good call, it does definitely help out unit cohesion. I always thought or kind of came to the conclusion or whatever that uh, the way you get close to somebody is to do hard things. Like basically you have to go through the whole spectrum of things, right. hard, easy, mm-hmm. good, and bad. And you go through all that together and still emerge without breaking mm-hmm. up or, or not being friends or whatever. So a lot of times if you, you're forced in a situation with this, uh, what do you call when the interest is? the same for everybody aligned. like aligned interests or, mm-hmm. or common interests mm-hmm. common goal. they're kind of forced to be in the environment so they go through the hard times the fun times they go through the whole spectrum of things mm-hmm. and a lot of times in the military and battle they go through the really really hard times mm-hmm. and then which kind of you know on the flip side can precipitate really really good times as well for sure. you know when you when you're triumphant with the guy with um next to you in hard times, that's a really, really good time. So if you have that consistently, yeah. boom, that bond. And same thing with like. It's funny when you when you started talking about good times, I was kind of like, oh, echoes being stupid. Mm-hmm. But then I thought about it. It's like, oh no, that's important. Like yeah. just hard times, cool. You're gonna forge one part of unity, yeah. but also like having fun and having good times is also a way that forms a yeah. certain part of the unity. Yeah, I think that a. Uh, a group that only has good times, you don't get tested. Yes. You gotta go through some hard shit too. Yeah. 100%. And, and that's what it always felt like where you gotta go through the whole spectrum of ups and downs mm-hmm. kind of together over over a period of time. Even if you don't go through it over a period of time, if you get the whole spectrum, you'll have a closeness that's kind of hard to replicate, mm-hmm. you know? But if you do it consistently, like for a long time, mm-hmm. yeah, you'd be, that's why brother and sister a lot of time or like, two brothers mm-hmm. who grew up together like really close or whatever um that's why it's like oh there's a diff- that's a different kind of relationship because it kind of like me and my brother were tw- are twins so mm-hmm. we literally went through everything together <laughs> literally yeah so like the first time of this of whatever experience mm-hmm. the first time was the first time for both of us yeah. like, you know so it, like the opposite time we wound up being really really close mm-hmm. but that was kind of like that's where it, i'd always feel like you know you i can go through an experience by myself and then a thought that's going to be really close in my mind, like it'll, it won't be a lot of time will go by before I think, oh, I wonder what he would think about this, yep. or I know what he would think about this, you know, yep. or you know, it like this, boom, you know, mm-hmm. like, and you get those kind of thoughts with the people that you're super close with. Yeah, and the the harder the combat, the tighter the bond, because also to your point the harder the combat, the better the times are when you're not in combat anymore. Yeah, and you kind of br- you kind of yeah. stretch out that spectrum, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like more, it's deeper or yeah. whatever. Check. Uh, this is an important thing that we've covered on this podcast before. This is a quick quote. Four brave men who do not know each other well will not dare attack a lion. Four less brave, but knowing each other well, sure of their reliability and consequently of mutual aid, will attack resolutely. There is there is the science of organizations of army of armies in a nutshell. And that's from uh, Battle Studies by Ardent Depeak, who we, we covered on this podcast, Battle Studies. But that's such a an important thing to remember. He's like, that's 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 the science of building an army. Mm. Working together. That's why at Echelon Front we talk about building relationships. Because mm. if he, we have a relationship, if I have a relationship with three other people, we'll take down a lion. If I don't know these dudes, we're not. We're not. I'm not stepping forth. It's not happening. You ever watch the movie Speed? Speed, speed, speed. Keanu speed, Reeves speed, 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 and speed. Sandra. Oh, I was on a They're bus on or bus. something. Yeah. I never watched it. Okay, it so looked really dumb. So there's a part at the end where they like f- kind of, f- I don't know, fall in love for lack of a better way to put it. And they even say, "Can you edit that out for this podcast? I don't like talking about that." What <laughs> love? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they they say uh I think they even mentioned it earlier where you shouldn't get into a relationship based on extreme experiences. Oh. Because it's like whatever the, mm-hmm. the reason or whatever. But that goes with kind of what you're saying cuz when you go through these crazy mm-hmm. experiences, it brings you closer yeah. together. That's like the like like Chaz in the wedding singer when he starts going to funerals to pick up girls. Oh yeah, that's sense. Or no, no, the wedding crashers. Wedding, wedding, crasher. wedding crashers. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. He says, uh, "Grief is the nature's most powerful aphrodisiac." 
There you go. These extreme yeah, situations. Going these extreme you know? situations. Yep. Um, tradition. Marine values and attitudes are stressed from the day, the first day of the Marine Corps and are constantly reinforced. We are told over and over again, a Marine never quits, a Marine never surrenders, a Marine never retreats, Marines never leave their dead and wounded. These are values become ingrained into the very being of every Marine. From the last parallel, Corporal Martin Russ, USMC. The average Marine, if such a condition exists, is definitely not the lad represented on the recruiting poster. More likely he is a small, pimple-faced young man who because it has been so skillfully pounded into him in boot camp, believes he can lick the world. (laughs) Commitment. There's a quote in here about commitment. Men take a kind of hard pride in belonging to a famous outfit, even when doing so exposes them to exceptional danger. This is an essential element in the psychology of shock troops. Talks about aggression. Compassion for the enemy and non combatants is a characteristic that is not uncommon among Marines in the battlefield. However, you must recognize that an aggressive fighting style is our trademark. Seek to maintain this determination and initiative as long as necessary to accomplish the mission and overcome the enemy. Understand that you will bolster the confidence of your Marines by accomplishing the mission at the lowest possible cost in casualties. Patriotism. Every Marine must be convinced of the right, rightness of their country's cause. Rewards and punishment. The purpose of our system of rewards in combat is intended to reflect the recognition of Marines as warriors. This recognition of heroic efforts and sacrifices on behalf of your fellow Marines is an important leadership responsibility. When it comes to combat, there is no amount of pay or any medal that can adequately award any Marine for risking their life to achieve a particular objective. When Marines who have experienced combat are questioned, they tend to respond that their greatest fear was being perceived as less than adequate in the eyes of their fellow Marines. Their only reward was the respect, praise, and recognition which came from within their unit. That is uh, no doubt. I've talked many times about what reputation means in the SEAL teams. And that's where you get that reputation. How do you behave in tough situations, in combat situations, even in tough training situations? Social factors affecting Marines' primary group, which is their fire team, squad, or platoon, are significant aspects of achieving combat motivation. Marines will often identify with friends who are from their same home state or same geographical area. This helps build unit cohesion. So getting the guys to work together. This section, discipline, esprit, decor, and proficiency are significant factors that you as a leader can develop in your Marines. These along with morale and motivation will influence your success in combat. Man, when you're skilled at something and you practice and you train, it just helps in every aspect. Proficiency is so important. And obviously, discipline. And I said earlier that we're going to get into a little bit of this. Discipline is the willful obedience of orders. Discipline is exemplified by a situation where the individual has been taught to sacrifice their interest for the common good and respond from a sense of duty which is more important than individual rights or wants. Now, what you and I talk about a lot in here, the common good, this is, you know, discipline, like self-discipline is when you're going to do something that's good not for you right now, not the donut, not the sleeping in, but what's good for the common good. Mm. That takes discipline. When the moment comes for a leader to send a Marine into harm's way, there's not room for discussion. Discipline ensures prompt accomplishment of assigned missions and spawns initiative, which guides your Marine's actions in the absence of order. Morale and motivation provide the foundation for discipline. More than being a simple mechanism for maintaining order, discipline is the essential condition within a unit that allows it to overcome the extreme fear and fatigue of combat. And this is why, this is the part that I wanted to get into. Uh, The three types of discipline. First off is self-discipline. Self-discipline is the most important quality to develop in your Marine. 
Self-discipline means that the individual has a sense of personal duty to their unit, fellow Marines, and nation. This type of discipline will hold your Marines sturdy against anything the enemy may throw at them because they have a firm inner conviction that they will not let their fellow Marines down. That's what we want. That's the most important quality to develop in Marine is self-discipline. And then it goes to unit discipline. Unit discipline is the behavior that results from the expectations of Marines in your squad. It arises from a form of peer pressure where a Marine knows that for an individual to belong, one must uphold the standard. This quality of discipline will hold the Marine steady while in the company of other fellow Marines. And then it gets to this, and this is why I wanted to cover this. Imposed discipline. Imposed discipline, this is probably the most important part of this book. Imposed discipline is behavior that is motivated primarily by your immediate supervision. Do it because I said so. It is a direct order to perform. Now, you've heard me say this many times. We don't want imposed discipline. And we definitely want to impose things on people. But here's the Marine Corps saying, you know, hey, do it because I said so. And then they continue. This discipline influences your Marines to accomplish unpleasant or inconvenient tasks. And then it says this. Under extreme combat conditions, you may be required to resort to imposed discipline. It says it. The words, required to resort to it. Mm -mm. This is not what we want to be doing. And by the way, it's under extreme combat conditions. So if you're working in a finance company or you're working on a construction site or you're working on a manufacturing line and you think as a leader you better use imposed discipline, you're probably wrong. And then it gives the example, this was the only way that Captain Barrow was able to force the necessary actions on the ridge in Korea that we referred to in the unit study. Imposed discipline lacks the permanence of unit discipline and the special strength of self-discipline. So imposed discipline is like a last resort in extreme situations. Your Marines demonstrate discipline through initiative, self-reliance, self-control, and obedience. The Marine Corps style of warfare requires intelligent leaders with a penchant for boldness and initiative down to the lowest level. It is the Marines' duty to take initiative as the situation demands. I like the fact that they start off by talking about initiative because that's what discipline you have to act or not act, but it's what you personally do. It's your own personal initiative. Talks about self-reliance, talks about self-control. Obedience. Self-reliance and self-control are pretty straightforward. Obedience is when your Marine responds without question. When all of your Marines respond to your orders as a team, a sense of unit is unit is created whereby everyone recognizes that their role is to contribute to something more important than one any one individual. An unorganized mob of Marines is useless in a crisis. The strength to overcome the extreme crisis of combat is greatly affected by your squad's ability to respond as a team. A squad is capable of dealing with the chaos of combat only insofar as the individual Marines' actions are part of the total squad effort. We, obedience, right? This is, this is, I'm surprised they didn't go a little bit more into you know, these situations where you're in extreme scenarios because otherwise obedience is what is occurring not because you have given direction but because everyone knows what we're trying to accomplish. Mm. That, that, that's how a good unit should work. A good unit should work, we get into an enemy contact and everyone knows what to do, not because they're obeying, but because they know what to do. They know why it's important. When you're at a company and you've got to keep quality up on your manufacturing line, people are not going to do it because you told them to do it and they are obedient and that's why it's happening. No, they've got to understand that the quality of the product is what supports the reputation of the companies, which is why People are buying the product, which is why we get to make the product, which is why the product is selling, which is why I have a job. Mm. 
Yeah. When they understand all those things, you don't need to tell them what to do. They're doing it. They get it. So that's the kind of obedience that we want. Not obedience that's coming from an external, but obedience because we understand what the mission is. I think that's an important facet there that didn't really come out in their explanation. Got a little section on esprit de corps. The unit, spirit, and character of the group. Not the individual. This is us working together. Some indicators. Expressions from Marines that show enthusiasm and pride for the unit. Good unit reputation among other units. Strong competitive spirit. Willingness to participate by the members in unit activities. Pride in the history and traditions of the unit. Those are all good things. Here's some ways to improve this esprit de corps. Be the symbol of fighting spirit you want to develop. Start new people off right by ensuring them they're welcome into and reception by the unit. Train your Marines as a team. Develop the feeling that the company as a team must succeed. Instruct them in history and traditions. This is something I explain a lot to companies. You gotta explain what's happening, where you've been, what you've achieved. Use appropriate, proper ceremonies, slogans, and symbols. Use competition wisely to develop a team. Try to win in every competition. Use decorations and awards properly. It says this, make your Marines feel they are invincible, that no power can defeat them, and that the success of core and country depends on them and the victory of their unit. Now we gotta be careful because we gotta watch out for arrogance, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) <laughs> invincible is a strong word invincible is definitely a strong word proficiency this uh, I mentioned this is so powerful because I think it helps your competence so much proficiency is advanced in knowledge and skill the example they give here is once again from the book Battle Leadership by Captain Von Schell in peace, we should do everything possible to prepare the minds of our soldiers to, for the strain of battle. We must repeatedly warn them that war brings with it surprise and tremendously deep impressions. We must prepare them for the fact that each minute of battle brings with it a new assault on nerves. As soldiers of the future, we should strive to realize that we will be faced in war with many new and difficult impressions, dangers that are thus foreseen and already half overcome. I'm going to say that again. Dangers that are foreseen are already half overcome. If you know what's coming, man, you're already halfway there. Already halfway there. In preparing for combat, of course, they go through a section. What do you need to know? Friendly capabilities, enemy capabilities, the face of combat, and mental and physical fitness. This is straight Sun Tzu, right? Know your enemy, know yourself. Friendly capabilities. This is not limited to knowing yourself and your job. This includes knowing your Marines, equipment, and weapons. Know the techniques of combat and the tactics that are used by a unit of your size. You gotta know the same thing about the enemy, enemy's capabilities, their weapons, their troops, their equipment. The face of combat. says the goal of this course is to help you understand the battlefield environment. Although that is not possible to realistically recreate the battlefield in training, you and your squad should learn as much as possible about the actual conditions of combat during training. You know, this is something I wrote about this in, I can't remember if I wrote about it in Leadership Strategy and Tactics or in the forward to about face, but about how I knew when there was no war, I knew there was like a gap that I was missing. I knew there was something I didn't understand. Mm. You know, the big the big mesh. Yeah. There was some element and I just tried to read to try and understand it. So I could figure out what I was looking at, what I was what I was in for. Mm. Building and maintaining morale and motivation in combat. Belief in the mission is the source of morale and motivation. That's why in Extreme Ownership, we we wrote a chapter called Believe. You gotta believe in what you're doing. You gotta believe in what you're doing. 
Developing this belief not only involves developing your squad's confidence that the job must and will be accomplished, it also involves a deeper understanding that their individual sacrifices and efforts are necessary and relevant. What do you gotta do? Instill confidence. Leadership from the front is particularly effective. Your Marines will always respond when they see that you are willing to take the same risks as them. Make sure you're assigning people to the right jobs. Make sure they get rest, food, quarters. Remember, four hours a night, you know, we gotta keep that going. And it says here, aside from providing food, rest, and quarters, you must also be concerned with attention to duty. You must check to see that positions and weapons are properly located, equipment and weapons are maintained, and that you attend to the numerous other details that make an effective combat unit. This requires that you have discipline and develop a habit of training and critiquing so that lessons learned do not have to be relearned. Maintaining morale and motivation. Know your Marines. Who's married? Who has kids? How many siblings they have? What special circumstances are they under? Provide a break in routine. This is sort of attached to what I was saying earlier, but I like this example. When possible, provide an opportunity for relaxation and recreation. At Kanthian in 1967, during a prolonged period under artillery enemy fire, one unit held a tobacco spitting contest, judging accuracy and range. Everyone participated in some humorous situations, resulted. So that's a good one. Isn't tobacco, have you ever seen tobacco? There's like True actual tobacco. tobacco competitions. Have you ever seen oh, that no, before? Oh, no, I have not. Yeah. What do you do, spit? Yeah. That that what they just said uh, accuracy and range, like they I remember that I remember this accuracy and range that there there's like little techniques to do it though mm-hmm. so one like there's a what do you call split finger technique where like you do oh, some, some thing uh, it was weird it was odd skills, huh? yeah it was it was kind of gross but I remember that being a thing check there's a section here. And it's, this is again, how to maintain morale and motivation. This is probably one of the most important things. Include subordinates in the decision-making process whenever possible. Again, Leif and I wrote about this. You never have all the answers and some of your Marines may have good ideas. Listening to your Marines is not required to use their ideas, but it will improve their morale to know that you are willing to listen to them. And by the way, they're gonna listen to you more. They're going to listen to you more. Maintaining discipline. Crucial elements, health. Check the physical condition of your Marines, foot inspections, changes in clothing, hygiene enforcement. Overall personal cleanliness must be continuous. Proper care for cuts, blisters, minor wounds, rashes, and other conditions directly reflect a unit's level of discipline. A unit's health discipline or lack of will affect its ability to fight. Man, check on your people. Make sure the weapons and gear is maintained appropriately. Make sure that people are staying in the game. Make sure they're keeping their helmets on and their their weapon close at hand, all that stuff. That's all important for discipline. Just like treating people with respect, maintaining that military courtesy. Rehashes on that. Combat may not require spit and polish, but it does not Remove you from the obligation that you have toward your seniors. Discipline is what separates your squad from a mob of armed civilians. <laughs> like that. Gotta like that. And building esprit de corps. Marines are competitors. Whatever the event or sport, they like to be challenged and they like to win. If you engage your Marines in competition against another unit, your Marines will band together to overcome the challenge, which will build a spree de corps. It's so good to have competitions. Whatever you're doing, you got a sales team, let's get some sales teams competing. You got competition on your manufacturing line. Let's see you can have the most squared away workspace in the office. Let's see you can have the most squared away job site at the construction company. And let's judge it. High standards come from teaching your Marines and then consistently correcting them. It's a bit strong, 
when I read that. Like, mm. dude, you don't want to be constantly correcting everyone. Mm. I guess it says consistently, consistently correct. Even that, I'm gonna back off a little bit. Mm. I'm gonna focus on what matters, mm. but I'm gonna pay attention if there's some slack happening. I'm not gonna let it get out of control. Mm. But don't don't expend a ton of leadership capital on that. Don't don't let that happen. Foster team thinking as a leader. Your squad consists of three fire teams, each with its own personality and capability. During platoon or squad training, have your fire teams compete against one another. Let the losing fire teams do the winners clean up. Like those are the kind of things. Good to go. Talks about um, when you train, train for the conditions of combat. This is something that's important is the way you do, th- the way you train impacts everything that you do. So, and and you'll, you'll mimic what you do in training with everything that you do. So for instance, we, we had rules when I was running trade at, like as soon as we rolled out of the gate, one of these platoons rolled out of the gate, it was a tactical mission. And so there was no like, oh, hold on a second. We, you know, we got a flat tire. No, it's like, you got a flat tire. You're changing that thing. It's tactical. Mm. You got some word to pass, do it tactically. Mm. There's a vehicle gets stuck. Hey, hold on. We got, no, no, no. It's freaking tactical. So that, that's how you keep that. And even like a resupply. Oh, we need more water. We just don't walk up to the freaking water buffalo and start filling our canteens. No, you figure out a place to resupply. You set up a resupply. Mm. When you say ta- it's tactical, like what? It's not like a nonchalant yeah. scenario kind of thing. Like, kind of like it's you stay disciplined with stay the way disciplined. you. Okay, stay gotcha. disciplined. There's all kinds of opportunities when you're doing that type of training to just to just like oh, okay, well, kind of go admin. I understand. Yeah. Matter of fact, we used to say that. Hey, don't go admin right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like you're pausing the actual training. Yeah. But you're saying no. Mm-hmm. This is still part of the training. The training is still on. And you know what? The trade act guys, my guys, influence that. Mm. So if my guys were coking and joking, it would it would immediately well not immediately in a lot of cases it would transfer over to the platoon. Mm-hmm. So if you got your if your trade at guys are like shooting the shit oh, yeah. because we're not part of the platoon that's supposed to being tactical, mm-hmm. it, it it like spreads. Yeah, yeah, I can see. So that. we would all act like we would be tactical. Yeah, there's so many. <laughs> I had a little moment of memory because JP and I were out on an FTX, and in the FTX we do at Echelon Front we use this high speed laser tag system, which is really cool. Yeah. But in trade at a lot of time we use paintball or simunition, which is shooting paint rounds. Yeah. And so one of the things that you could do as an instructor is as a, like let's say a platoon's walking down the street or they're walking down a hallway mm. and I was grading them or watching them, mm. I would go up and sort of like cover my face and kind of crouch down as if I was about to get shot with paintballs. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd see like the, the platoons would get so hyped, like you could see they're just instantly going to full alert mode because uh, yeah, yeah. they think they're about, about to get shot. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'd have like, I'd, I'd have like a little like, uh, put my hand up over my face just to kind of hide from the impact of the simunition. And you'd do that one like the training is not going on kind of a thing? Or when would you do that? Let's say a platoon is walking down a hallway. During a training During exercise? During a training exercise. Okay. And, and they, of course, there's a thought in their mind like, hey, we, we might get shot at right oh, now. Yeah. But when they see me covering up my face and yeah. covering up like my groin with my hand because <laughs> right, I don't sure. want to get shot. Sure. Or if they see JP like holding his face and putting his hand over his right. over his crotch because he didn't want to get shot. When as soon as they see that yeah. out of the corner of their eye, they're like, "Oh, it's coming!" Because you know okay. we're yeah. a trade at we yes. know what's coming. Yeah, you're the instructors. Yeah. You're not okay. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, there's actual like pranks on YouTube. I said I don't really condone the pranks, but mm-hmm. you can watch them on YouTube where people will do that kind of stuff. Where just in public, like the people just in public, mm-hmm. like they'll. Like cover themselves, oh, just like like oh, something yeah, might yeah, be coming something or happened. something like that. Yeah, and then and watch yeah, the people react sure. the exact same way. So it seems like an element of nature there, where yeah. it's like, yeah, of course. And know? then you, 
it's not just an element of nature of trade act because you are probably about to get <laughs> shot. So, <laughs> yes, but that's sir. important as a trainer that you you maintain that high level of professionalism and you can't be coking and joking when you expect the platoons to be tactical and you're right. sitting around like an idiot. Yeah. Uh, there's an example in here from Chesty Puller from the book Marine, which we covered on the podcast. Bad news only increased the tempo of Puller's training. He cornered Colonel Pedro de Ball, the great gunner who commanded the 11th Marines. And he said, Colonel, you'll be starting artillery training next week. I want you to let me know when you'll fire. I want to get my troops under it as often as I can. Every day afterward, the men of 1-7 were in the field and the 11th Marines were firing. Shells streamed overhead until the whoosh of flying metal became as familiar as rifle fire. There were many bursts nearby, but no accidents. Polar was the only battalion with such training. He's just taking his guys out, getting them conditioned to, well to freaking bombs going over your head. So good stuff. And the last little section here that just talks about fitness, physical and mental fitness. Combat is physically grueling. The demands made on your squad are going to be extreme and vary with the environment in which you are operating. Routine physical training in Camp Lejeune or Camp Pendleton is not going to prepare your Marines for the oppressive heat and humidity of Okinawa or the extreme cold of a Norwegian winter. Demanding but creative combat-oriented physical training will serve as a better way of getting your squad into shape. And then it says mental fitness. Map exercises, tactical exercises without troops, and professional reading all help to prepare you and your Marines for decision-making in combat. These forms of training are not exclusive to officers and senior NCOs. They are a way of practicing warfighting intelligently without having to bring your entire squad into the field. And you do get better at decision making. You do. I would got to see that all the time in trade, and I still get to see it with with leaders that we work with at Echelon Front. They get better at taking a step back. They get better at detaching. They get better, better at analyzing things, and they get better. So that, and also that mental and physical fitness that we're talking about is not just for you as an individual. It's for your teams. That's what it's for. And if you're a leader, you're responsible for your teams. And that means whether you're working in business, whether you're working in the military, whether you're a first responder, or whether you are a mom or a dad, because you got a family, and you're responsible for the physical and mental fitness of your troops. So there you go. And I think this manual reinforces the fact that combat is like life and it's like life it's just amplified and intensified because obviously there's more at stake but the the lessons apply the discipline the mental and physical fitness telling the truth so we're not getting rumors leading from the front confronting your fears supporting other people having discipline not imposing discipline on your team asking your team questions letting them come up with a plan all these things are in here Universal lessons for being a better combat leader and really universal lessons for being a better human being. Speaking of which, Echo Mm -hmm. Charles, we're trying to be better human beings across the board. Yes, we are. We're on the path on the program. That's what we are. I don't like saying on the program that as much. Because it indicates that, like, it's kind of this unique, like, you're on the program versus you're, mm. you're off the program. Like you, don't, like, you don't necessarily have to be on the program the whole time. The path is just a way. Mm. It's the way. Mm. So it we're all on the deep. path. We're working out, reading. We're listening. Uh-huh. Listening more than we're talking, hopefully, hopefully generally speaking. we hope so. Yes. We hope so. Um, through that path, you will need supplementation or it'll, I'll put it this way, it'll benefit you a lot. You'll be, you'll be that much better off mm-hmm. on this path because it's not always easy. Trust me, I know. So, yes. So, let's start with energy drinks. If you're into energy drinks, mm-hmm. we've got good news. We've got a healthy energy drinks called Discipline Go. By Speaking Jocko. of unique, that's a unique thing, yes, by sir. the way. Yeah. A, a healthy energy drink doesn't yep. exist except for right here. There you go. Yep. True story. There's other people that are like, oh, well, ours is healthy, but we put 350 milligrams of caffeine yep. into it. Yeah. It's not healthy. You can't call that healthy. You can't put a label on it that calls it healthy. It's a lot. You can't put sugar in there and say it's healthy. You can't put chemicals in there and call it healthy. That doesn't work. That's not the truth. I agree, yeah, fully. So we have something legitimately healthy. Yep. Good to go. 
Yes, sir. Yep. Discipline go. Boom. Many flavors. Eight of them, if I'm not mistaken. I think mango's the best one. Mm. Seems to be uh seems to be what the robots like as well. That's huh? you know, <laughs> many, many entities like the mango. It's a good one. You know, but hey, choose for yourself. But the good news is there's options, is what yeah. I'm saying as far as flavors go. Um again, a healthy one. There's no real energy drink out there like it. And you look, you can have an energy drink. Mm-hmm. Boom. Get the upside. Yep. Also, Discipline Go is also a pre-workout. There's yeah. a pre-workout form. Okay, for the last few days, I drink coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, coffee. Am I addicted to coffee? Mm, I don't think so. How many cups a day? Oh, One every day? Two. Like two. Oh, okay. Two every day. Maybe three, okay. but it's all at once. Jeez. Like in the okay. morning. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, it's like a big coffee. Whatever. Okay. I'd say almost every day. Mm-hmm. But if I don't have it, I don't get a headache or nothing yeah. like that. So I don't know that I'm addicted to mm-hmm. coffee. Okay, so what's even, up with that pre-workout? So... For the past three days, I have no coffee, but I worked out first thing in the morning. Look at Actually, you. more than three days. Okay. Yeah, more than three days. Um, but I work out in the morning, so I'm not going to drink a coffee, then do the pre-workout. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it's kind of double, what do you call double dipping unnecessary. So you're going straight to the pre-workout. Straight to the pre-workout. One scoop and a half, by the way. Okay. I don't get the weird. Not it, here's the thing: the jitter of the coffee, and it's mm-hmm. not really a jitter for me anymore. It's more of just a little buzz kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I do, you don't get that from the pre-workout. I don't even mind the jitter, by the way, mm-hmm. that buzz or whatever. I don't mind that. But I did notice that you don't get it. But I'll tell you what you do get. A kick-ass workout. <laughs> so you don't even need the coffee. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So yep. anyway, yeah. So you can use it as a pre-workout. Again, it's a powder. It's good. Tastes just as good. Makes it whatever you want. Water. Whatever. Oh, but very good. This will help you on the path when you're working out. Trust me, you want to be that much more better off when you're on it. Trust me. Um, also, we got some protein. Hmm. This is high quality protein. Dessert. Better, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> this dessert. It tastes very, very good. If that means anything to you. Yeah. If you want to choke down low quality pro- protein that tastes kind of junk, this is not the one for you. But this one is good. Yeah, you're gonna want that gratification of just eating something that tastes delish. You know right? the. You ever, <laughs> you ever seen the meme or whatever it is? That's like, oh, yeah, you can eat whatever, whatever. And it's like, oh, that face you make when now I want something sweet. Mm -hmm. Right. I haven't seen that meme. There's a meme. And there's funny ways of presenting it, but it comes Mm -hmm. in all different forms or whatever. Um, But it always reminds me of that. You know, it's essentially usually someone who's like, let's say they overconsume. We'll say that. And, you know, I'm super full, but now I want something sweet kind of a thing. Like, mm-hmm. that's a thing or whatever. Well, no. it seems to be a thing for me because mm-hmm. I be drinking milk. It, even, after I've, even after I have a straight-up tomahawk steak. Uh, I, I think that's why it's a mean is like, a, you know. Mm, I'd say yeah, it's true. more, I would say s- 65% of the time mm. when I get done eating something that is, like, uh, steak. Mm. I still want to have a little bit of a little dessert. I want to have a little milk. I'm getting on the milk train. Do you drink milk just in general? Like, oh, I'll just have a cup of milk or glass of milk. It's gonna have milk in it. Cause why yeah. would I even? That's like just the one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. <laughs> no, but you know how like okay. So I'll tell you this. I like, guess if I was gonna, if I was gonna, let's say we had a little scenario happening where I was gonna have a chocolate chip cookie. Right. Yes, sir. Uh. Then milk with no milk would be in play. But you know how some people drink Uh, milk with dinner? That's the norm. I had a keto um, uh, peanut butter and chocolate cake the other day. Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Uh, Very shockingly amazing. But I also had a little bit of milk, milk, regular milk, because it was, that was kind of the, that was what I was feeling. Yeah. But the keto chocolate peanut butter cake credit was given sure. trying to be what's the purpose of keto chocolate peanut butter cake because then you're not there's 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 two things look i could tell you that hey you know you want to stay in ketosis and all this stuff i wasn't even in ketosis when i did that <laughs> right but here's the thing when if you if right now if you and i sat down and ate a piece of like whatever just giant chocolate cake filled with sugar I would feel like crap. Would you feel like crap maybe in two hours? Yes, okay. probably. I would feel I would feel like crap in like two hours. I'd be like, oh, I am f- whatever. Uh, what's the word? Uh, lethargic. Lethargic. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. two hours, okay. or yes, maybe even in like, it, is, it probably doesn't even take an hour. Immediately. Yeah, I, I'm not immediately, you. but you're like, oh, I just doused my system with freaking sugar. Yeah. And you feel like crap. Yeah. When you, 
and when I had this, and I've had several keto-ish desserts, yeah. right? Yeah. And the, they're good. Mm-hmm. And then you go, huh, I still feel pretty freaking good, you yeah, know? Okay. So that's why. I understand. Yeah, I'd rather have that. And, and I'm telling you, they're, they're kind of like milk. You know, you can have a milk, like it's a milkshake. Yeah. You can have one of these and you're not like, oh, I still really want a real peanut butter freaking chocolate cake or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Certain things don't pair well, though, with like chocolate cake or keto chocolate peanut butter cake mm-hmm. or whatever. Like, it, like it's too much chocolate. Like, let's say milk didn't exist. Right? Mm-hmm. You, you eat a chocolate chip cookie. Mm-hmm. You can drink some white milk. With yeah, you it. don't want chocolate milk with no, it. No, it's yeah, too much. Sure. Doesn't pair well. Exactly right. Yeah, the, mo- the pairings. I, I pair some stuff every once in a while. Like, but here's the thing: my pairing is kind of off. When I eat chili, you know, like chili, uh-huh. chili and rice, maybe some cornbread, if we're lucky. Um, I like milk with chili. Is that, that's weird, right? It doesn't seem I like don't know. that's the jam. It seems like a good call. I think it's yeah. a good call. Yeah, for sure. When I was a kid, my mom would make spaghetti, and I would just sit there at the table like the rest of the family would be done gone for an hour and i'd be sitting there just eating spaghetti and i would have a gallon of milk and just pouring glasses of milk and just pounding <laughs> okay it. so that's exactly you know that what time frame when you're i don't know four, 13 14 15 16 your stomach is literally a bottomless pit yeah, bro, you cannot so eat enough so true yep. you can't my mom said i used to be like asleep in the car when i was like 12 or 13 and just wake up and be like, can we get food right now? And my mom said, if I didn't, if we didn't get over to a Mickey D's mm. stat, yeah. then I'd start getting hangry. Bro, it, <laughs> <laughs> I understand fully. And that is a thing. Yeah. That's weird. That And you, I never thought about that specifically, but I do remember mm. where like, okay, so I have this cousin, Eben, Eben Charles, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Eben, we, E-B-A-N? E-B-O-N, if uh, I'm not mistaken. E-B-O-N. Okay. E-B-O-N. Mm-hmm. I forgot how to spell it. Nonetheless, Evan, <laughs> um, he so he came to visit, and we're the same age. So mm-hmm. he was, but or he was maybe a year older than us. I forget. So I think same age, and we we're I remember because we we're in like sixth or seventh grade. But he was huge, he's huge, mm-hmm. like tall dude, super tall, and he would drink a whole half yeah. gallon of, of juice. You know the half gallon oh, cartons of juice, the whole thing. He just drank it. I was like, bro, like I can understand <laughs> like that that juice is delicious, and I said, but man, I'm not like. I'm not ready for that. That's a <laughs> lot of juice to drink just in one go like that. <laughs> and that's a lot. Two years later, I remember drinking a whole half gallon of oh, juice. Oh, yeah, because you were in the zone. Yeah, well, because I grew up. Yeah. To, you know, I, I don't think I was even his size, but I was like, th- at that time, I was like, yeah, maybe 14, 15 years old. Mm-hmm. So I drink the whole thing, and I remember thinking, oh, yeah, Eben was pounding this juice the same way, but I get it now, bro. When you're thirsty, you just want to pound that juice. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Sure. But yes, the, and yes, I am thinking your stomach is kind of like a bottomless pit. You eat the whole yeah, thing of cereal. Uh, whole thing. You know? Whole thing like it's nothing. Jocko's over here just pounding milk. Yeah. The whole for shit. Gallon of milk. Nonetheless, milk. Milk. Put get, milk get in there. The milk put tray. whatever. Yeah. And there's a, good, a lot of cool little recipes you can add to the flavors if you want. It's not necessary. Totally not necessary. But if you want, you can you can enhance that milk if you like. Um, also, for your immunity and for things that you don't want to want to worry about. Try workout. Try lift weights. If you're into lifting weights, which you should be, I think you should be. Yes, yeah. doctors think you should be. I, from what I'm understanding more and more, uh, resistance training mm-hmm. and weights, are, in my opinion, the best form of resistance mm-hmm. training, is the healthiest thing you can do for you, barring like ailments. You got heart things, situations, all the stuff, and of course, cardiovascular has a lot of health benefits. But as far as like immunity, uh. Balance of hormones, uh, cognitive, like all these benefits, resistance training, yeah. from what I understand, has proven to be we the best lifting, one. We're right? lifting. We're lifting. We're lifting. If you're lifting heavy mm-hmm. yeah. and you're, let's yeah. say your joint, <laughs> let's say your joints aren't all that, we'll say, or mm-hmm. they're bothering you, whatever, your body will not let you lift heavy. Mm-hmm. It'll try to be like, hey, let's yeah. not lift heavy. Yep. It's yes. Just, it's, it's bad. It is bad. It's bad. And it's your body telling you that. And it's your body actually saying, hey, look, we wish you could, but you can't. Yeah, it's kind of like. It's your body going, hey, you're old now. Just forget about it. Just give up. D-O-R. Well, yeah, maybe not the D-O-R, but, <laughs> but kind of along those lines. You see what I'm saying? Let's say the morale of your body tends to lower and lower when your joints, your oh, immunity, yeah. all this stuff. Um, and it's a natural Dude, mechanism. Dude, I surfed yesterday. My shoulders were. Uh, 
they, it's weird. They, they were just sore, not like uh, injured or anything like this, but yeah. like that motion. Yeah. And I'm not so much I've been surfing like every day for a couple, maybe like a week. Oh, yeah, sure. And my shoulders are tired, yeah. sore, but not sore, injured, like, oh, I can't paddle. Right, right. You know, so it's, there you go. And yeah. those shoulders got some miles on them, man. Uh, yeah, and I we're just joint warfare up. I understand. Bro, yes. Joint warfare up. So for these ailments, joint warfare, super krill, mm -hmm. that'll keep everything in the game. And then, then the, there's the vitamin D3 and the cold war. That'll keep your immunity in the game, which Boom. you need. By the way, I don't know if you knew that. But, uh, strong immunity, strong, strong life, man. Boom. 100%. Boom. But yeah. Boom. You, yeah, you can get this stuff, by the way. <laughs> you can get this stuff at, at jogglefuel.com. Mm. You can get this stuff. You can get the drinks at Wawa. We got some other convenience stores coming online pretty quick. We're already in a bunch more, but I'll actually put together a list of those. So, yes, Wawa, you can get all the stuff at Vitamin Shop as well. Go in there if you want to try something out. There you go. Yep. If you subscribe to any of this stuff, which I recommend, then you can subscribe on jockofuel.com and you'll get shipping for free. Because, yep. look, let's face it, we're competing with big, there's a big company around I've heard of that's shipping stuff for free. It's true. Even though they charge you money, kind of. Yeah, they do yeah. actually, not kind of, they do charge you yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, huh, the membership. So free shipping, what does that really mean? It means I paid you money and you're shipping. Was that free? Prepaid shipping. Who are we, what are we doing? Is that where we're at? Yeah, I guess that's where we're at. Yes, yeah. sir, it is. So we're not gonna charge you to subscribe. You subscribe and you get free shipping. We're giving you a better deal yeah. than some of those other big companies. It's essentially just a recurring. It's not even like a paid subscription. It's yeah. a discount subscription, essentially. <laughs> Boom, win-win. Good to go. Yep, good to go. Um, also, Origin USA, this is where you can get your American-made stuff. Mm -hmm. So jeans, boots, some athletic gear, durable goods. Bro, he's coming out with some good pants, bro. He had some, um, like, what color were they? Like green, like whatever. He he made a post, mm -hmm. Pete or Origin. We got all kinds of stuff coming. Bruh, it said next uh, print camo, and I think they're like camo jeans. We're we've got stuff coming, bro. We are we are investing. Look, when we say we're gonna, we've been. When we say this is rebuilding America and rebuilding manufacturing America, does that mean when we make money, we go, oh cool, we made money. Let's go, uh, you know, buy a freaking new Corvette. <laughs> right? No, no we're no. not buying Corvettes. No, sir. I'll tell you what we're doing. We're buying more factory. We're buying more equipment. We're buying more material. We're reinvesting back right back into this this mission. Yeah. So when you get a pair of jeans, thank you cuz it's going to allow us to make more jeans. It's going to allow us to make we're bringing out a whole line Origin Hunt. You probably heard me talking about it on on Joe Rogan. We got all that is in full swing. Mm -hmm. Full swing, getting that stuff designed, getting it. We're doing the test various uh, of the various um, layouts that we're using. Mm -hmm. So this stuff is coming. Yep. And it's going to be made in America, 100%. That's what we're doing. So we appreciate the support. OriginUSA.com. We're, we're, we are, we, meaning you, listen to this right now. It's not just, it's not just us at the company. We can't, we can't rebuild manufacturing in America without the support of you, this just won't, will not work. It will not work. If you don't believe in rebuilding America, then this thing fails. If you don't believe in bringing manufacturing back to America, this thing fails. When you support though, we're gonna be unstoppable. And you know what, I'm willing to bet. Pete's willing to bet. In fact, we're betting the farm. We're betting everything. We're betting everything that America will come together and, and help us bring manufacturing back to America. And listen, we are in an economic war. We are in an economic war with China. This is factually what's going on. We are in an economic war with China. And you and me and Origin, we are on the front lines of the economic war. We are the shock troops. So we appreciate the support, originusa.com. Oh, yeah. Some jujitsu stuff on there as well. Best skis in the world, literally the yes. best skis in the world, and kind of by far. Because speaking of win. combat, you want to be in economic combat, we want to win. You also want to win on the mats of justice. So get yourself an origin gi. 
I know there's a lot of them out there. A lot of people, if you're gonna, look, if you're, if you're training jujitsu, which you should be, if you're not training jujitsu, start training jujitsu, and then get an origin gi, represent. Otherwise, again, you're, you might be winning the combat front on the mats, but now you're losing the economic war against China. Think about that. Like, oh, cool, I'm winning, I can beat, I can tap this person. Oh, but I'm, my nation is losing a war against a, another communist regime. Is that where you're at? Origin USA, people. Yep, it's true. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's Bring it. Go. Also, Jocko's store. It's called Jocko Store. So you go to jockostore.com. This is where you can get your shirts, hats, hoodies, some shorts on there. Discipline equals freedom. Represent while you're on this path. Stand by to get some. Stand by to get some. Good. All day. Good. All day. Also, there's a shirt locker. That's our subscription service. It's a good one. Mm-hmm. Some good designs on there. Good designs coming up. I got a Valentine's Day design. It's actually Dude, not. you got to be kidding it me. It is not a Valentine's Day design. Unapproved. It's totally. Here. So I shouldn't even have said Valentine's Day. No, I shouldn't have. But it does come out in February. Because I'm mad about it now. There's the color red on it. How about that? There's no card on it. Is the color red from blood dripping from a sword? <laughs> That's classified. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's some good designs uh, on there, past and present, of course. Um, if you're a member, you can even buy, and you're like, hey, uh, what about the past designs? Do I have access to those? Because they, they come out once a month, and they're kind of gone. Mm. They're not gone anymore. You do have access. Once you're a member, you have access to the past designs. So, boom, that's an added benefit and upgrade. Right on. Just by becoming a member. Boom. There you go. Subscribe to this podcast. Also, don't forget about the Unraveling podcast. Just recorded another episode with DC. And we are also just set some things up so that we can start doing more of those. And we're also going to do, we're going to start talking about what's going on in the world a little bit more timely. So when things happen, look, we're not going to chase the 24 hour news cycle because I'm not chasing the 24 hour news cycle because at least 80% of the 24 hour news cycle is bullshit. That doesn't matter. But there is 20% that is strategic that needs to be talked about, that needs to be explored. And so DC and I are gonna start putting that out more often. So be ready for that. That's the Jocko Unraveling podcast. We also have the Grounded podcast. We got the Warrior Kid podcast. We also have Jocko Underground, jockounderground.com. Again, we look, we don't know what's gonna happen with all these platforms. There's massive influence in the tech world that is that is controlling the platform that you're listening to this right now. And we don't know what they're going to do with it. We don't know if they're inserting uh, advertisements into when we're trying to put out some word or we're trying to explain, you know, what's what's going on in the world. So we have jockounderground.com. If we ever need it, it's there as a contingency. If you want to be there and you want to help us support, then go to jockounderground.com. It costs $8.18 a month. If you can't afford that, we still want to support you. So if you can't afford that, email assistance at jockounderground.com and we'll, we'll figure it out. But we appreciate your support there as well. We have a YouTube channel. And on the YouTube channel, Echo makes videos and then I usually give him the key element that makes his videos good. Look, they'd be good. Thanks, Jock. They would be good, mm-hmm. but usually there's one little element that needs to be sure. added in there, you know. Yeah. And I'm always here for you. That's where you come, assistant in. director. Think, yes, sir. Thank you for that. Also, the video version of this podcast, by the way. Mm, if you want to see what T-shirt Echo Charles is wearing, yeah. then you at, can do at that. Any moment, it's true. Um, yeah. So yeah, there you go. Also, Psychological Warfare, which is an album with Jocko on each track telling you how to get through your moment of weakness. This is an effective tool. It's a digital tool. So yeah, you can get that wherever MP3s are offered. Flipsidecanvas.com, Dakota Meyer, making awesome stuff to hang on your wall. Got a bunch of books. Final Spin, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, The Code, The Evaluation, The Protocol, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. Way the Warrior Kid, Way the Warrior Kid, one, two, three, and four. Get those books for every kid that you know. You will do so much to enhance their life and get them moving in the right direction. Mike and the Dragons for the little kids. 
about face by Hackworth. I wrote the forward on the new version, extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership that I wrote with my brother Leif Babin, who I also have a leadership consultancy with called Echelon Front, where leadership is the solution. Go to echelonfront.com if you want us to come and help you with your company, if you wanna come to one of our live events, and you can also check out our online training, the Academy, called extremeownership.com. If you want to learn to take ownership of your life, of your business, of your family, of your fitness, of your health, then go to extremeownership.com. I'm on there two, three times a week live to interact. You want a question for me, just go on there and ask it. Extremeownership.com. And if you want to help service members active and retired, their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got an amazing charity organization and she helps veterans and their families so much. Go to America's Mighty Warriors.org if you want to donate or you want to get involved. And if you want any more of my lame lectures, or you need any more of Echo's disorienting declarations. You can find us on the interwebs, on the gram, on the Facebook, on the Twitter, on Getter. Echoes at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. And to the Army, Navy, Air Force, and for this manual today, especially for the Marine Corps. Thank you for being leaders, doing the toughest job in the world, and that is going into combat. And to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders, thank you for doing what you do here at home. Also, an incredibly tough job, which is keeping us safe. Thank you. And everyone else out there, think about all these factors. Not just for leading Marines, but for leading yourself. And it says in the book, the self-discipline is the most important quality. It is your personal duty to yourself. And if you develop this discipline, then like a disciplined Marine, you will hold sturdy against anything that's thrown at you. Based on that firm inner conviction that you will not falter, you will not flounder, you will not fail. And to demonstrate that discipline to demonstrate that discipline you have to show self-reliance you have to have self-control and you have to have initiative to make things happen so take some initiative go out there and get after it and until next time this is echo and jocko